for everyone's in attendance. Uh, so we'll start. We need to start right away uh, with our public hearing and the, on the FY 2019 budget, and then uh, from there we'll we'll go into the to the rest of our uh, agenda items. Uh, you know, again, uh, very. Yep. yep. Yes. You hear that? Yes. Can you hear me now? So, uh, as I was saying, we're going to uh, start right away with the public hearing. Uh, we'll uh, go as long as, as we need to. Uh, I do want to uh, pay attention to uh, time because we do have an important rest of the agenda. And But I would, uh, so if you spoken once, I want to try and get uh, everybody through, uh, and then if it's, you know, if it's not midnight at that point, uh, we can uh, let people go through again. So if you can come up here and just uh, state your name and address and uh, make comments. Uh, this isn't a, a dialogue with the school committee. Uh, we're here to listen, and, and that's what we're going to do, and I'll, I'll make sure of that as well. Thank you. Mr. Robinson, I just want yep. that if people are going to speak, they need to speak at this microphone over here. Right. So who's up? <laughs> First one. <laughs> Eric has been volunteered. Signed up first. Okay. Thank you. My name is, this mine up. It's on, you, you're gonna have to get closer to it. So uh, Eric, uh, go ahead, so and ev for everyone, uh, make sure you, you're talking into both of those because I think they had trouble hearing RCTV. Thank you. My name is Eric Goldstein and I uh, serve as the president of the Reading Teachers Association. I'm here this evening to represent the nearly 400 teachers who work for the Reading Public Schools, many of which are in attendance tonight. We want to let this community know that we care very deeply about Reading's children and its schools. Unfortunately, this community, again for the fifth consecutive year, faces a budget that must be cut. Once more, there simply are not enough funds to provide the same services next year as there were for this year. Revenue simply is not keeping up with the costs. We care about the programs that are going to be eliminated and the students that will suffer because of it. We care that this budget will mean opportunities for students to grow and learn will be diminished. The middle school model is being squeezed so teachers have less time to work together and there will be no foreign language at Coolidge or Parker. We care that class sizes are likely to rise in grades three to five. Opportunities like virtual high school and elementary course will be eliminated and tutoring supports will be taken away. We care that the dedicated teachers will lose their jobs and students will lose their teachers. So much of our students' success is based on building positive relationships with their teachers. These cuts make it harder for those relationships to develop for every single child. We care that the schools we pour so much of ourselves into will continue to slowly slide away behind other communities. However difficult, these destructive financial circumstances have galvanized us. As an association, we stand tonight for ourselves and our students. We stand here united to protect the quality of instruction that we know our students need and that they deserve. The teachers of Reading are resolved to stand up for our students, our schools, and ourselves. We are asking this community to stand with us and pass an override to save these schools from the damaging cuts that we face. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Heidi Murray, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I have been a teacher for 20 years. In the past 18 years, I have taught second grade at Birch Meadow Elementary School. I feel deeply committed to the Reading Public School System, and I am involved in numerous district committees. First, I want to share with you that being a teacher is the best job in the world. To have the opportunity to make a difference in a child's life is truly a gift. Unfortunately, tonight, I need to express my deep concern and worry about the failed override last year and the need for an override to pass in the spring of 2018. It does not feel good at all to say this statement, but it is true. I am not nearly the teacher I was when I first started teaching in Reading. With the ongoing budget cuts, I feel my lack of time to prepare lessons, not being able to purchase current curriculum materials, lack of technology support in and for the classroom, support staffing hours being cut, the decrease of professional development are all major factors in my inability to teach at the level I did when I first started my teaching career here in Reading. Over the past years, teachers have also experienced significant cuts in the per pupil budget. These drastic, drastic cuts have caused teachers to order basic classroom supplies instead of new curriculum items to enrich our grade level curriculum. All teachers want to differentiate their instruction to meet the needs of all the different learners in their classroom. Without the funds to purchase these materials, it just cannot happen to the, the degree that we would like, or more importantly, what the children deserve in Reading. As I was thinking about tonight and the future for the Reading Public Schools, one thought just kept coming back to me over and over again. We have to do it for the kids. I am hopeful that the town will do just that, put the kids first and give them the education and give the teachers the support they need to do their job the best they can. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Julie Merrill and I'm a sixth grade English language arts teacher at Parker Middle School. I've been teaching for 17 years. Ten of them have been here in Reading. Growing up right here in Reading, I went to Barrows, Parker, and Reading Memorial High School. So I feel that I have the perspectives of both the former student and current educator in the system. I also speak as a current Reading resident and taxpayer. The Reading school system has been a huge source of pride for this town for as long as I can remember. A place where we offered a robust range of academic courses, exploration through various enrichment opportunities, a strong sports program, and a wealth of options in the arts. Tonight, however, I'm deeply saddened and fearful of the direction in which our town seems to be heading. Because of our current financial constraints, a budget has had to be put forward that Dr. Doherty candidly states up front is not in the best interest of the students of Reading. Although middle school is not any more important than any other level, I'd like to highlight the impact on the middle grades because that is my daily world where I've spent the majority of my teaching career and such an awesome place. Without an override, there will be seven teachers cut from the middle schools. That's seven less adults working with students ages 11 to 14 who are in a highly transitional stage of their life. At Parker, each sixth grade team will be going from two English teachers to one. Coolidge will experience similar cuts. The impact on the students is that they will have half the amount of daily literacy instruction. Sixth grade students come to middle school with a range of reading abilities. We work hard across all grades to identify struggling readers and to provide them with intervention through small group instruction with the reading specialist and ELA teachers. By doubling the amount of students each sixth grade ELA teacher will see, yet cutting the time they have with each student in half, I'm deeply concerned about more and more students slipping through the cracks. 
Our three-year district improvement plan for the Reading Schools strives to address four key areas of student growth and development. With the recommended FY19 balanced budget, I feel that at least three of these areas are in jeopardy. With less teachers working with our students, it is unlikely that we will make progress towards closing the achievement gap in our high needs group. Second, how will we focus on improving literacy instruction in all subject areas when we are forced to lose 50% of the current literacy block? And third, our district has a goal of identifying and implementing evidence-based instructional practices and interventions which will improve social emotional learning for all students. A huge part of teaching at any level is forming trusting relationships with students so that they have a safe foundation foundation from which to take academic risks and grow as inquisitive, resourceful, and unique individuals. It goes without saying that cutting the number of teachers available to students cuts the number of supportive adult interactions our children will have, clearly making it even harder to focus on healthy social and emotional development. At the same time, the budget team has had to recommend completely eliminating foreign language from the middle school, moving us further from our overarching goal of instilling a joy of learning and inspiring the innovative leaders of tomorrow. We will be losing much of the flexibility of the middle school model and decreasing the experiences to which students have access. In fact, we are moving backwards and the people bearing the brunt of it are, are our students. I know the quality and collegiality of Reading teachers and I know that we will continue to provide the best experiences we can for our students with what we have. But the simple reality is that we can't continue to have cuts as we have for the past five years and expect that we will continue to do more with less. I wish I was being dramatic when I say that our kids' futures are at stake here, but sadly I'm not. It's a sobering reality, but it's not defeat. The teachers are united for the cause of our students, the people we are here for every day, and we urge all members of the community to stand with us, as so many of you already do, and to help rally enough support from our fellow town members to put our kids first and provide them with the education and the opportunities that they deserve. Thank you. Hello, my name is Casey Vieira. I go to Parker and I'm in eighth grade. I will preface this by saying that the proposed elimination of the foreign language program for middle school doesn't exactly affect me. My friends and I are in eighth grade and in 2019 we'll be in high school, meaning we'll be able to continue taking Spanish classes. If I wanted to, I'd be able to make it to AP Spanish in senior year. But when addressing this override, we must not think of ourselves. We must think of the kids, the kids like my brother, Jack, in seventh grade, who will have to start all over again in high school with Spanish 1. My sister, Kate, in sixth grade, who will have to wait patiently until high school to learn Spanish. And my brother, Joe, in fifth grade, who, despite his eagerness, will again have to wait for high school. We have to think of the teachers, like Mrs. Christie, who loves her job and cares for her students like Mrs. Fox, who consistently puts all her effort into making sure my peers understand their work. We have to think of all those who go unnamed, all the students who have this opportunity taken away from them, all the teachers who will be left to find another job somewhere, all these wonderful people who have put time and energy and hours and hours of work into perfecting the art of a foreign language. Foreign language has enriched my life more than I thought possible. I am proud to say that Spanish is my favorite class in school. It is fun and I have learned so much about other people's culture that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. It has taught me memorization skills and study skills that have assisted me in other classes as well. Foreign languages truly mean so much to me. It is not their education or those kids' education. It is our education. It is the town of Reading's education. In a matter of 10, 20 years, we will be Reading. 
Sure, people will come, people will go, but in the end, we will be Reading, and we represent a future generation that requires knowledge of culture to help us navigate growing, more integrative societies. We need yes for this override. Gracias. <laughs> Hi, my name is Smirtha, and I'm in eighth grade in Parker. My name is Sarah, and I'm also in the eighth grade at Parker. We know from what we've been informed that our district at the moment is in a very tight place as the options to save foreign language in the middle school are dwindling. We realize that we are young. We don't know much about solving budgets or trying to find the money to save this all. But what we do know is that for us and countless of our peers, foreign language is something that we deeply enjoy and has opened doors to new possibilities for us. My sister is in college, and over break, she comes back telling me about all these stories about some of her friends who are in fields of knowing three to four languages. And afterwards, I would think, wow, that is really the coolest thing. What if that's where I might want to go with my life? I may very well choose that as my path to get a job, or just for the sheer fact that speaking another language is really amazing and contains so many benefits, such as connecting with people and all across the world. But then I realized I would get such a wonderful opportunity that countless others that come after me would not have. And that makes me sad. For so many students, these limitations ultimately close doors to exploring new possibilities in the future. I already have such a wonderful privilege to be bilingual through my own parents. And I just wish upon the others that they would have the same privilege as me. Foreign language has benefited us as both students and people in unexplainable ways. It has become an invaluable aspect of our middle school experience, one that we didn't truly appreciate until it was almost taken from us. As eighth graders, we faced the same struggle last year, and when the fate of our foreign language program was uncertain, our community came together to support it. Though we faced the same obstacles we have before, we're here again and hoping to show you foreign language is still worth it to us, still to us an irreplaceable part of our education. This year we will not be affected by the budget cuts, but every other future Reading student will. On behalf of all those who will never even get the chance to miss their foreign language, we urge you to try to find a way to reconsider the budget and keep our foreign language program. We really thank you for giving us the time to speak of this issue in front of you all, and hope that you consider foreign language as too much of a necessity to remove and rethink that decision. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? My name is Lena Williams and I am here tonight wearing many hats. I am the director of guidance at the high school, but I am also a parent of two elementary aged kids in, at Birch Meadow who are in the first grade and third grade. I am here tonight to give a passionate plea to every parent and community member listening to support our schools. I am not here to debate the significance of one program over another or to share my thoughts on where I think the budget sh cuts should come from. I believe every program we have, every position we have, and every person that works for the school system plays a vital role in the success of our children. Unfortunately, the Reading Public Schools has taken a hit for the last few years, and I have seen firsthand how this has affected the staff, but more importantly, the students. As a community, we need to step up and financially support our kids. Two months ago, I spoke at the Yes for Reading kickoff meeting and shared the challenges we face at the high school level with the previous budget cuts. It became apparent very quickly that parents and community members knew the overall numbers of the cuts but did not understand the intricacies of how the cuts directly impacted our students. 
I want to share some of these struggles with you tonight to help you understand the importance of a significant override to not only prevent the cuts that were presented on Monday night, but to, to repair the damage that has been done the last few years. We need our schools and students to stay competitive with surrounding towns and stop settling for the minimum. Please know my talk tonight is not to advocate specifically for the high school, although I do want to advocate for the high school. <laughs> my purpose is to help you understand how cutting teachers, positions, and programs at any level will negatively affect our schools and our kids, as I have seen firsthand. In the last two years, we have cut eight positions from the high school, reducing staff in every area, including guidance. In English, we lost a total of a .6 teacher, which is three sections of English. For those of you that don't know, a section equals a class. In history, we lost a .8 teacher, which is four sections of history. In science, we lost a full-time position over two years, which is five sections lost causing most science classes to be at capacity, leaving no room for kids to switch levels if they're struggling. In science, we have historically maintained a cap of 24 as recommended by the National Science Teachers Association for safety and liability reasons. This year, we've had to exceed the cap in physics and AP chemistry. We have a large number of students interested in STEM careers who elected to take two science classes, but were turned away from their second course because we did not have enough teachers. In math, we lost a .6 teacher, which is three sections, but we increased the number of options for students to take extra math courses. We have roughly an extra 100 students doubling up in math this year, yet we cut teachers. We have nine classes of math this year with 28 to 34 students. AP Calculus has 34 students. Honors Algebra II has 32 students. Freshman Algebra I has 30 students. In the arts, we lost a full-time staff member. In business, we lost a .6 position, which is six sections. Wellness, we lost a full-time position over the last two years when it was already reduced by a .8 position the year before, causing many PE classes to be as high as 40 or more. While the arts business and the wellness departments took some of the hit, it negatively affects the students in all academic areas. Reduced sections means we have less options for us to have the flexibility to create a full schedule. Fewer sections means higher class sizes, which in turn means it takes teachers more time to return graded tests and papers. In addition to the reduction of teachers, the high school was hit hard with the district technology cuts. In June, we were able to purchase new e-textbooks, 18 personal computers for physics labs, and 30 HP student laptops with carts using the science initiative funds. Due to the budget cuts in the tech department, the new science laptop carts have still yet to be set up for the teacher use. Students were not rostered for e-textbook use until October. PCs were not set up in the physics classroom until last week. AP Computer Science did not have computers for each of their kids for the first three weeks of school. Laptops were not imaged or put into existing carts for many months after school started. Teachers entered the school year with software installations that were not completed or broken computers not fixed. These are the types of things that affect the quality of learning and the morale in the building. The tech issues were not due to a lack of effort or staff not doing their job. It's due to the reduction in staff when there is an increase in technology usage at every school. I was pleased to hear Dr. Doherty inform the public there will be minimum cuts at the high school next year since we took the heaviest hit the past few years. But this doesn't mean we won't be affected in years to come by the cuts next year at the elementary and middle school level. Every elementary student who will be sitting in larger class sizes will not be getting the same academic and personal attention of their older peers who benefited from smaller class sizes. As we have seen firsthand at the high school level, elementary teachers will be more stressed, have a wider range of students with learning differences in their classroom. Teachers will be pulled out more often due to IEP meetings. Teachers have less time for planning, communicating with parents, or to simply take a minute to notice a child who may be struggling internally. As a parent in the system, I'm extremely concerned with the, this possibility and know the difference it makes when a student has a solid foundation at the elementary and middle school level. 
Let's keep in mind, there will no doubt be an increase in special ed referrals in future years simply because these students did not get the appropriate attention in the younger years. An increase in special ed numbers means an increase in the budget. As a guidance director, I cannot comprehend not having a foreign language program at the middle school. I can't understand reducing the amount of time students will be taking language arts. These are instrumental in preparing students and allowing them the opportunity to get to the highest level of classes in high school. My point in raising these concerns is not to argue the importance of one program over another. It's to show you that cuts do not affect us for one year. They affect your children for years to come. We need to build kids up. Your kids spend seven hours a day in school. 80% of RMHS students spend an extra one to four hours a day in extracurricular activities. School isn't just about tests, quizzes, projects, and homework. It's about relationship building, learning how to make healthy choices, making mistakes and learning from them, and so much more. Without small classes, it's more challenging for teachers to make connections with each of their students, and therefore accomplishing these goals is more difficult. I am here speaking to you tonight because I care about the quality of education in Reading. I want the best education for your kids. I want the best education for mine. Our kids are not the ones that get to choose if we raise our taxes, but they are the ones to see and feel the budget cuts every day. We need your support for our students and give them what they deserve. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? <laughs> I, I have a <clears throat> somewhat of a desire to speak in an Eastern European accent, but I don't think I will. Uh, my name is uh, Jeffrey Ryan. I have been teaching for 40 years. For the last 21 years, I've been here at Reading Memorial High School, uh, and it's the best job I've ever had, and I can't imagine going anywhere else, as I was talking with my Friend Mr. Doherty today, I'm 63 years old. I could have retired quite a few years ago, but I don't want to because I want to continue to be here and teach history and set fires under the, or set the souls on fire of kids at Reading. I don't want to set them on fire. Uh, actually, actually, that's what uh, St. Ignatius said, was set, you know, set them on fire. That, I don't think he really meant that. But, uh, but uh, anyway, no, we want to set their souls on fire so they will go out and end world hunger and uh, get rid of AIDS and human rights abuses and all the kinds of things that we who live in a democratic society condemn. Let me just stop for a minute and talk about what pr probably everybody is paying attention to rather than what I'm saying. Uh, I'm wearing a somewhat unusual outfit uh, and the reason is that I thought if my speech were forgettable, uh, at least people r would remember what I was wearing. So th this, is a, this is a replica of the cape that Franklin Roosevelt wore at the Yalta Conference uh, at the end of World War II in 1945, just so that you know. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. I want to talk about something that really is more, has more specificity than a lot of the things that other people have been talking about. And, and that does not imply that the last several speeches have not been fantastic. I just want to focus a little bit about something that, that um, often gets ignored or forgotten, and that is college recommendations. I don't mean to imply that that uh, college admissions are the sole reason for public education because they're not, but I know that college admissions is a high priority among the families in this community. Uh, I know it is for the kids themselves, I know it is for the parents, I know it is for the school committee. There are essentially four things that make up a student's portfolio when he, such as Niall Singer, who was applying to Bowdoin last year, successfully got in, he will know, uh, his, uh, his portfolio consisted of his grades, his SAT, or his standardized test scores, his personal essays, and his 
formal teacher recommendations. I wrote one of them. He got into school. Uh, he might have gotten into Bowdoin without me, but the fact is that teacher letters are very important. They are not, however, a requirement of our job. That does not mean we don't want to write them. It just means there is not a contractual obligation for the faculty at the high school, or anywhere else for that matter, to write recommendations for children. We do it as a courtesy, and we do it because we love the kids and want to help them. What I'm concerned about, though, is that with the inevitable increase in the class sizes that will occur if the, the override is not passed, that ultimately teachers will have so many students that when they are approached and asked to write a letter of recommendation, they might have to say no. There was, this year I only wrote 35. <laughs> which is actually quite a lot. Each one takes about three hours. And we don't do it, we, it's, it's not part of our job. So because it's voluntary, we do it on our own time. So that's 35 times three. I'll let you do the math, because that's not my subject. <laughs> one year I wrote 73. This year, Zach Rope, Broken Rope, an English teacher, wrote 85. That's a lot of letters. I don't know what Zach Broken Rope's magic number is, when, what the tipping point is, but we're all going to have one. There's going to come a time when kids will come to me and say, Mr. Ryan, will you write a letter for me to go to college so that I can go to college? And I'll have to say, I would love to. I think you're a wonderful kid. I think you have everything going for you, but I don't have time. I don't have time to write a letter for you because I have written so many already, because I have classes to prepare, because I have meetings to go to, because I have to drive to and from work, because I have to eat and sleep and exercise and take care of myself so I don't drop dead in front of my students. Seriously, uh, this, this is going to become a problem a serious problem. What will in likely happen is that there will be kids who will not get, will, who will not be able to get an agreement from their, the teacher that they know the best, and it will break our hearts, I promise you, sorry. It will break our hearts, I promise you, to turn kids away, but there are only so many days in the, in hours in the day, in we, days in the week, and all of that calendar stuff. So kids will get turned away and they'll ask another teacher and that teacher also might be too busy. <coughs> My intent is not to be a prophet of doom, but the fact is that it is likely that not too far in the future there will be kids who are very qualified to go to highly prestigious selective colleges who may have trouble getting recommendations. That will then of course result most likely in the decline of college acceptances, which is not fair to the kids, and it's not fair to the parents, and it's not fair to anybody. But that's what will happen if we don't do something to, to fund faculty positions so that you have teachers who can write college letters on the faculty so they can be there to do it. If they can't, then college acceptance will, acceptances will go down I heard someone this morning saying, I've had it, I'm putting my house on the market, I'm going to sell it, I can't wait till the market plummets and property values start to go down. And her friend said, oh, now, now, don't be upset. She said, I'm doing it. When I told my friend Jim De Benedictus that, he said, well, if she does that, that's going to start to plummet. And I sure as heck don't want to start to plummet. I don't want Reading to go down the financial toilet. But um, I'm afraid that if we don't take action to save the schools and prevent layoffs, and if we don't keep the teachers on the faculty who will be there to write the recommendations, that the district, the quality of the district the services that we can provide and the chances that they can get into really good schools will decline.
please, please, everyone in this room, I implore you to commit yourselves to do everything you possibly can to make sure that my dire predictions never come true. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, my name is Andrew Spinelli, and for the record, I was gonna wear a cape too, but I didn't want to clash with <laughs> Dr. Ryan. <laughs> Um, I am a seventh grade English teacher at Parker Middle School and I'm here tonight to speak on behalf um, of the middle school English department with specific concerns about the cuts to English language arts. Um, so the, the ramifications that will stem from the elimination of our double block English language arts block at the sixth grade level it are going to be felt, um, as Mr. Williams said, all the way up to the high school. Uh, there's no way that doesn't happen. And the quality of education that we're able to provide our students will ultimately suffer. Um, currently, due to the two class periods in sixth grade, ELA teachers are able to alter the pacing of their curriculum, revisiting concepts that might pose difficulty for students and providing a specific period each day in which the focus can be on both reading and writing. The loss of this time means an acceleration of the curriculum and less time to build upon or emphasize concepts in greater detail. Much of the sixth grade ELA curriculum deals with the direct teaching of skills such as inferencing, identifying main idea and theme, and the components of plot. Students entering sixth grade are often not yet proficient in these areas and require explicit instruction. They are still building many of the foundational reading skills. The focus on the direct teaching of these skills at the 6th grade level means that by 7th and 8th grade, students are better able to focus on the analysis of literature and higher critical thinking skills. The loss of direct teaching time to these concepts would mean more basic skills would need to be taught in the upper grades, which would result in the slowing down of the present 7th and 8th grade curriculum. A curriculum, by the way, that as a department we are very proud of its rigor. It just can't happen without the double block of English at the sixth grade level. Moreover, the elimination of the double block will leave less time for sixth grade English teachers to address reading strategies that are specific to content areas. The consequences of this will be felt by students as they progress through their academic careers and the content area reading becomes more involved and intertwined into every subject. As teachers of children first before content, we are fearful of the results of cutting the current ELA time in half in sixth grade and losing four full-time teachers who are dedicated to students at such a transitional and pivotal age. The remaining sixth grade ELA teachers will be responsible for twice as many students throughout the school day with half of the time to access them. Such a drastic increase will not only negatively impact our ability to identify specific students' reading needs, but it may also, also alter the rate at which we're able to identify the social, emotional, and well-being of our student population. Students often reveal themselves through their writing, and as English teachers, we have a front row seat, helping us form meaningful relationships. Research shows that two of the most influential contributors to student success are timely feedback and relationships. By increasing the caseload of our 6th grade ELA teachers, both of these critical factors will be severely compromised. Beyond the current proposed budget, our schools have endured years of smaller cuts that have slowly nicked away at our ability to provide students with the kind of support that they need and frankly deserve. Speaking from the perspective of Parker teachers, a few years ago our school lost our .5 reading specialist position. Although we still have one full-time reading specialist, that one teacher is responsible for providing interventions to a building of almost 600 kids. Another effect of the proposed budget will reduce the number of periods in a middle school day to six, which will, will result in an even more packed schedule for our teachers and far fewer opportunities to provide small group or one-to-one -one interventions to those students who struggle to demonstrate proficiency with concepts and skills. Our district has a, a strategic plan with focus areas that include the achievement gap and literacy. Regardless of the outcome of the next few months, we know that the dedicated staff of the Reading Public Schools will continue to pour our hearts and souls into all that we do to foster the growth and success of each student. That's what we do, and as those people can attest to back there, that's who we are. 
Unfortunately, we have reached a point where the district's vision is just not attainable without the proper resources. These goals, however well are articulated, are simply unrealistic. Without the proper resources, these goals are simply words and wishful thinking. Before vacation, seventh graders across the district finished their study of a completely unabridged version of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Which, by the way, um, I would challenge you to find other school districts that have their kids read the completely unabridged version as seventh graders. Late in stave four, after the ghost of Christmas yet to come shows Scrooge the consequences of a life filled with greed and isolation, Scrooge begs for redemption, adding, quote, men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if preserved in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Scrooge knows that he's at a crossroads in his life and his next move might make or break his fate. In the coming months, the Reading Public Schools, com schools community will be faced with a similar dilemma in experiencing the consequences of choices. Are we re willing and ready to face these consequences? Because it doesn't take a visit from the ghosts of the future to let us know just how grim that vision is. The emotional challenge of this week has uh, that this week has provided has only validated our commitment to our practice, our profession, and most importantly, our kids. In every conversation that we have been a part of since Monday, we always end up at the same destination, the kids. They deserve better than what this budget represents, and as a department, we will continue to fight for them, determined that the quote, ends will change, and result in an educational experience that we can all continue to be proud of. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leah Christie. I am a seventh grade Spanish teacher at Parker Middle School. And um, although I am the speaker tonight, I know that I am of my colleagues as well. It is extremely disheartening to be standing here this evening again, a year later, and have to implore the Reading town of Reading to do what is right for public school students. I do not really feel this is the audience to whom I need to reiterate all of my points about how important foreign language is or the magnitude of a mistake it would be to cut the program at the middle school level or the long-reaching negative effects that would ripple from this decision. We heard from students, teachers, parents, and taxpayers last year, and I walked away feeling so validated after listening to speaker after speaker voice support of foreign language learning and teachers. I felt the message had been established and was clear. Community members do not want teaching positions and learning opportunities, particularly in foreign language, taken away from the students who will be the future in Reading, in Massachusetts, and in this nation. And deep down, I have to believe each member of the school committee and our superintendent and other leaders know this to be true and surely cannot justify this, this decision. Which is why it is difficult to comprehend how this crucial curriculum is on the chop block again. I honestly feel a single question can be asked. Does it sit well with you that the Reading Public Schools will be one of the few districts in Massachusetts to not offer foreign language learning opportunities to their middle school students? Wow, even saying that aloud makes me realize how preposterous it sounds. We're talking about Reading, Reading, Massachusetts, a district with no foreign language offerings in middle school? Reading, sticking out like a sore thumb among every town that borders it as the sole district preventing students from accessing foreign language learning in middle school. It does not sit right with me, and it certainly should not sit right with you. I ran into a former student last night at Market Basket. The young man is 20 years old, he's at BU. 
He proudly told me that he's minoring in Spanish. Of course, it makes sense. There are hundreds of fields where foreign language is a highly sought after skill, making those who study it instantly more marketable than their competition. A fascinating article published on the first of this year was following a study by the well-known and high-performing company, Google, on its hiring, firing, and promotion data. And it made the case that foreign language learning should be regarded as the single most important subject area to obtain qualities that cutting edge employers are seeking. The study revealed the most successful additions to companies possess seven soft skills. Communication, being able to take different points of view, having empathy towards others, critical thinking, decision-making skills, being more perceptive, and being observant. Each of these skills are byproducts of foreign language acquisition. It's no surprise that the highly touted STEM program has been modified to STEAM. No one can deny the significance of language arts and its weight on our ever-changing world. Language learning supports academic achievement, including higher standardized testing scores. Students who study foreign language outperform students who do not, especially in math, even when time on learning language reduces math instruction. How can this astounding and rewarding subject area be what you are choosing to remove when it is soon to be one of the most valued by progressive employers? You are virtually robbing students of what they need most. I said it last year and I'll say it again. If Reading is truly committed to offering a rigorous curriculum and to prepare students for a global world, this decision surely contradicts those goals. Foreign language is a rite of passage. Sixth graders are genuinely excited to choose their language and the enthusiasm carries into seventh grade, which why is, it's why, if it cannot be started earlier, onset of adolescence is the optimal time. It is one of my favorite parts of my job, their curiosity, their willingness to take risks and find their voice in another language. Last year, eighth graders who were moving on to the high school were selected to speak to their peers about their experiences at Parker, and each of the three students mentioned affection for foreign language in their speeches. You have no idea how heartbreaking it is to work with my current students and know it's a dead end. Today was Parent Visitation Day. Parents got to see firsthand their students in action. They want to be there, they're engaged, they're doing it, they're creating language at a high level, they're talking about language and academic language, and they are also making comparisons to their native language. These seventh graders will come to a grinding halt and have to start over in ninth grade. At that point, there is no chance for them to reach advanced placement level. When high schools have less AP options, their ranking suffers. Foreign language is a graduation requirement. Colleges look for at least three consecutive years. It's embarrassing that we would consider cutting their legs out from under them, removing their first two developmental years. Dr. Doherty said the presented budget will still provide a strong education. I respectfully disagree. I wouldn't even call it adequate or status quo. It is subpar. This is the direction Reading is headed in, backwards and to an antiquated system. I cannot even trace back to when early foreign language think, um, sorry, I cannot even trace back to when early foreign language instruction wasn't an option for students. To me, it's a non-negotiable. I cannot wrap my head around how in good conscience this is on the table in a recommended budget. Reading's reputation was once an innovative, top-performing school district committed to investing in future generations. The descriptors have changed, and we are hearing phrases like slow dismantling, steady decline, and downward spiral. Excellent and effective teachers are going to leave, and parents are going to pull their students out and send them to private schools. With the crash of the school system comes the crash of the property values. The time is now. There are bright people in this room and something has to be figured out. 
You weren't comfortable with the options last year, and it's even worse this year. Please do not act as if your hands are tied. Regardless of if the override passes or not, this cannot be our best option. This budget is unacceptable, and our talented young students deserve better. Thank you. gets their notes together. Uh, my name is George Katchen, live on Colburn Road. Uh, I am a senior. I've lived here for 28 years. I don't have any kids in the system here. Um, I moved here because school system, there were a lot of reasons. I like the location, etc. I like Reading. I like the town. And I want it to be sustained. And I like the school system. To me, the school system is so important in any society. I mean, it's so important. I loved everything the last speaker stated because it's, you know, property values. Yeah, they'll go down if the school system is bad. And it's so important that kids get more than the three R's. They got to, as, they, as someone phrased, the three C's. Creative thinking, communications, and collaboration. And that helps students to develop the capability to live in and to be competitive in this global economy. It's not just our little town, it's everyone. And by the way, if the students are educated and have the creative skills, and as some of the speakers talked about, risk taking, and therefore you need small classes so the teachers can interact with the students, so they aren't afraid to come out with crazy ideas. That's where we grow. That's where the creative juices come. And if, if they're educated, they're less likely to be a burden on not only Reading or society as a whole, less likely to have to take drugs because they can't get their act together. So I think it's so important. And as a senior, I mean, a lot of us are preaching to the choir here. And it's important, I mean, the last speaker talk, spoke about saying all of this a year ago. And that's pretty bad. I mean, I voted for the override in 2016. Uh, I didn't attend any of the meetings. I'm just a believer in education. But the fact that you had to say the same things then and the town didn't vote, that's very bad. I think the citizens of the town, I urge my fellow seniors and citizens to tune in, listen to, the, uh, to RCTV, and hear these very passionate speeches that were given. I mean, I mean, I was really impressed. I mean, I loved it. But I think we have to act now. And, you know, people have to recognize costs go up more than 2.5% per year. That's a fact of life. And we don't want property values to go down. We want to be able to take care of all factions of our society. But we have to be a viable economic center. We have to have well-educated kids who then return to the town what they have learned. So thank you to uh, the teachers and the students who spoke tonight. Very proud of you guys. Good job. Thanks. Coachella, and uh, I just I don't have anything formally prepared, but I feel very inspired right now to speak to everybody. Um, I'm a mom of three. I'm very new to Reading. Uh, I grew up in Medford. My husband grew up in Somerville, and uh, I just 
come into Reading, I feel like, you know, this was the town. This was the town that my husband and I were going to make all our sacrifices to do the right thing for our kids. And my oldest is in kindergarten. And, you know, when we were looking for houses, you know, we spent, we spent a long time looking for houses. And um, Reading just became more and more appealing. And the reason for that was the education system. That was, that was it. That was it for us. And we figured if we can make a little bit more sacrifice and get ourselves into Reading, we've done the right thing for our children. It's almost like a no-brainer. We did the right thing. We can kind of let the system take care of itself and be there to support our children. And um, right now, listening, I, I, I've only been here for a year and a half in this community, and I love it so far. I'm so happy that we made the decision. But when I stand here and I listen to the proposed budget, I listen to the teachers, um, you know, even, even the program, the foreign language program that may be cut, it hurts. It hurts me inside, and I know it hurts all of you. And what I got to say is that it, it almost feels like I was blindsided in a way because I hear that there's been cuts for five years. And to me, that sounds like we're, we're five years behind all other communities. Hmm. And uh, if the override is our only option, then I'm all in. I support it um, because I don't, I don't see how you guys or this town, this community can take more and more hits like this to the education system. Like I said, I have three, three kids and my oldest is in kindergarten. So I got a long way to go in this community and I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay here and um, I want to see this community grow. I don't want it to go backwards. And, but the thing is, it's okay if we take small steps back, if we can take big steps forward. And it, right now it doesn't seem like that. It seems like we're taking pretty big hits. And um, you know, I just hope that I just hope that everyone here tonight will make the right decision. I hope that um, you know, going forward, we'll be able to sustain ourselves even if the override is passed. Um, and I just really hope that you know, I, I just don't want to see teachers lose their jobs. It, it, that's that's the bottom line. And I want our kids to succeed here. And um, Thank you guys, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Bring this down a little bit, sorry. <laughs> um, hello, uh, my name is Rebecca Carmo and I am a student here at RMHS alongside my friend Caroline Rehm. Um, in light of the proposal of the balanced budget that has already been brought to the attention of many of you here today, we are here to represent our student body, who normally would not have a say in these kinds of decisions. As students in the, as students in the past and present, we've had to experience the effect of these budget cuts, and we'd like to bring such matters to your attention tonight. In regards to the multiple teachers who have lost their jobs in the past five years alone, class sizes have increased tremendously. With the added personalities in each class, teachers are prompted to much more class management than actual teaching. This takes away from our learning experience and decelerates the time spent on certain material, resulting in having to skip over information because of lack of time. As well as this inconvenience, we students have to wait extended periods of time to get work back to us, given our teachers have bigger caseloads. Our learning process has been slowed down, hindering us as students who are expected to be competitive in our high school career to make sure we all get into good colleges or are well off in what we choose to do after we leave these four walls. As each year goes by, the average population of graduating classes are increasing. This often means that students don't get their first or second choice for electives, but often their third or fourth. Students are being less exposed to different subject areas that could spark their interests and influence their decision in what they do after leaving high school. Electives not only provide more exposure to new materials, but to different people as well. Starting in seventh grade, what level of a subject you take is normally what you stick with throughout your secondary education. Electives allow you to meet new students and peers that you wouldn't know otherwise. One of our peers, Courtney Coutone, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, expressed that her closest friend was someone she met in the basics of our class, an elective, and she's forever grateful to have the opportunity to meet someone that would be a part of her life even two years after. While the school allows us to meet new people, we also are prepared for, pe for people we encounter outside of school. Our foreign language department prepares us when meeting people who don't speak English or traveling to different countries where English is not the primary language. 
Growing up as a first generation child, I learned Portuguese before being alphabetized in English. Throughout my years in the education system, I've been helpful and effective in helping new students who come from different countries and don't speak English. As someone who was bilingual, many teachers and staff often appreciated my presence and aid in making sure students get the information they need and adapt nicely to the environment at our schools in the United States. Portuguese allowed me to be of use, and thanks to teachers like Ms. Smith and Mrs. Murphy, I was able to be of help to the Hispanic community as well. This summer, I participated in a service project taking place in Honduras, where we aided to multiple villages and hundreds of people who didn't have access to basic needs. Being able to communicate to the Hondurans made things so much more smoothly, and they greatly appreciated our efforts to help them and to also communicate with each and every one of them. Opportunities here as well opened up for me. As much of, as much of my time was spent um, serving, um, helping and serving a Hispanic church and participating in their worship and um, being an active leader for the youth who attended. The Foreign Language Depart Department has allowed me to communicate to 399 million people in the world today as Spanish is the second most spoken language in the world. Taking away foreign language is not the answer, but implementing it into lower grades is. Knowing two languages as of young helped me help others, and that's what I feel is one of the primary purposes of my own existence, giving and helping as much as I can. There are many positions in the school that are helpful. Teachers are here to make sure we have a good ed education, and administrators are here to implement order. Secretaries are also here for our betterment, and a good example of one is Ms. Clark, our secretary in the guidance department. With a calming presence, Ms. Clark makes the guidance department a place where students may feel comfortable to go to get help in a different way. As people with lives outside of school, we have different stresses and pressures on us to succeed, to help our families, and to be our very best. Ms. Clark makes it her mission to help any student who comes in that is upset and can't be seen by a counselor, normally due to them being with other students. Spending her time helping the student body in an emotional sense, she often stays after school, long after her contract hours to get her work done. Helping the counselors by taking away some of the stress of trying to help everyone and helping us students who sometimes just need a breath of fresh air. Ms. Clark is the perfect example of someone who is passionate about her job and more than important presence here at RMHS. With all that has been said, our hope is that Reading, as a community, understands that we students can't afford to have this balanced budget go into effect. What we truly need is more funds for education. In all my years of education and being part of two other districts who are in areas of lower to middle class, I don't recall seeing these kinds of cuts being made and having to live the effects of them every day. Living in a community made up of successful people, middle to upper class, we the students ask you to invest in us because we in fact are the future. We are the lawyers, the politicians, the court justices, the teachers, and the doctors. I'm Rebecca Karma and... I'm Caroline Reem. And on behalf of the student body, we ask and we plead that you will help fund the future. Thank you. My name is Casey Waldman and I am a freshman at RMHS. As all of you know, there are a lot of budget cuts for next year. The high school is losing an assistant principal secretary. All of them are amazing and deserve to keep their jobs. For example, the guidance secretary, Mrs. Clark. I'm going to come back to Mrs. Clark later, but now I'm going to tell you about one of my experiences when I was at Joshua Eaton. As a fifth grader, I was bullied, which made my already present anxiety and depression even worse. I often missed school or came in late because I couldn't get myself out of bed, but I made it through. Fast forward to sixth grade, where I was still heavily affected by my experience, I started to be able to begin a new chapter of my life, even if it still lingered in my head. I still had a hard time coming to school and was late almost every day. Middle school was better and I got more help from the staff around me. I learned how to advocate for myself and even better, stand up for myself. Getting myself through those three years were one of the hardest but most rewarding things I've ever done. Considering the things I went through, I was nervous about starting high school. Most people are, but this was, this was different. I physically felt anxious and scared for what it was going to be like. I had already planned to meet with my guidance counselor on the first day. So during my study, off I went to meet someone that would make my first day a success. If you guessed that that person was Mrs. Clark, you were right. 
The minute I walked in, without even knowing who I was, she smiled. You know those people who just make you happy when they smile? Mrs. Clark is one of those people. She immediately greeted me, and it made all of my worries go away. Over the past five or so months, I've gotten to know her really well. When I think about going to school in the morning, sure, I think about the test that's coming up, or the French homework that's due in 45 minutes that I may or may not have done. But it is definitely not as much anxiety that I felt when I was in elementary or middle. Instead of being late almost every day, I come in early just so I can make time to see Mrs. Clark. My high school experience has been better because of her. She makes, every, she makes someone's day brighter and cheers you up when you're down. She's someone who you can go to with all of your problems and she listens. Mrs. Clark is a vital part of the guidance department. Lots of times guidance counselors are busy with other meetings, sometimes when you are in need of a person to talk to. Luckily we have Mrs. Clark, who connects with every student and teacher she meets. Her presence is so welcoming and loving. It makes everyone feel like they belong. I don't know what I would do without her, and I thank you all for listening to me today. Hi, my name is Kelly Travis. I'm a junior here at RMHS. I'm standing before you all today at this meeting to vouch for someone here who is more than just an employee of the school system, but someone who has changed my life. As many of you know, there may be budget cuts in this town, and sadly one of the positions that would be cut is a secretary, and it's possible that it may be Miss Clark. There are so many good things to say about her that I'm not really sure where to begin other than the beginning of it. Miss Clark and I met when she came to the school, since I was a pretty frequent student in guidance. Sometimes I'd see her once a week, other times all day. Depression and anxiety are unpredictable, and Miss Clark knew that. No matter what your story or background is, she always gives you the utmost respect and attention you deserve when speaking to her. Since the beginning of the school year, Miss Clark and I grew a lot closer, since guidance is one of the only places that helps calm the tsunami of anxiety I experience every day. Many people don't understand the concept of anxiety and that everyday things can cause a sudden rush of fear. Public speaking causes me a lot of anxiety and the only reason I could get myself up here was because of her. Not only has she made all the guidance counselors' lives easier, but also mine and many other students that come into guidance every day. Miss Clark took the time and effort to learn kids' names who felt invisible to everybody. She took the time to get to know a kid and their story, which is rare these days. She made the effort to learn mine, and I honestly can't express how much that meant to me. She was there for me through pain and days where I didn't think I'd be able to make a whole day of school, but she found a way to keep me there. She always has. Miss Clark is the only person who has found a way to make school the place that I look forward to going to every morning, the place that I actually end up missing on the weekend somehow. She changed school in my mind from anxiety and complete dreadfulness to my second home. She cheers me on when I do well on something and supports me when times are tough. During my time at Guide and sitting next to her, I've noticed many things. For one, she really likes to drink coffee out of her mug with a picture of her family on it. <laughs> she drinks about three cups in the morning. <laughs> I've also noticed that she really appreci appreciates the little things, whether it be someone complimenting her outfit or someone simply calling her ma'am. Out of all things I've noticed, one thing that stands out the most in my opinion, this one trait sets her aside from everyone else. She can tell when you're having a bad day. This became clear to me the day a girl walked into guidance choking up, about to break. She sat down at one of the tables and just lost it. The moment this girl lost it, Miss Clark stood up and walked over to comfort her. Eventually, Miss Clark brought her into the conference room and talked to this girl until a guidance counselor was available. I don't think Miss Clark realized how much help she was to this girl. I saw the girl's face when she came into guidance and saw her face when her left. When she left, it was instant relief. I cannot explain to you how much that 15 minutes or so that she spent talking with Miss Clark changed her day and mood, maybe even her life. One thing I know for sure is that she has changed mine. I could go on for hours about the impact that Miss Clark has had on many students here at Reading, but there are not enough words in the English language to explain the impact she has had on my life. I want to thank you, Miss Clark, and thank you for giving me the courage and opportunity to stand up here and speak before you tonight. Oh my God.
Hi, I'm Rebecca Lieberman, and I'm going to start by um, reading statements from my kids. Uh, first, I'll start with my daughter, Madeline, grade 11. As a high school student, I have greatly valued my foreign language classes. The classes that myself and fellow students have taken allow us to consider many new future op options, such as studying abroad in a country that speaks another language or hosting an exchange student. The chance to be able to experience other cultures is invaluable, and I believe that students will lose many opportunities and a great portion of educational experience if they are denied the chance to learn a foreign language. And I have a statement from my senior, Joshua Lieberman, grade. My name is Joshua Lieberman. I'm 18, and I'm currently taking AP Spanish. Over the years, I've reaped massive benefits from learning the language. The study of grammar structures has helped me tremendously in my English classes, and memorizing vocabulary and paragraphs in Spanish has taught me important problem-solving skills that I will continue to utilize in college and beyond. I decided to take Spanish as it makes me a much more well-rounded person. As Spanish, as Spanish is the second most spoken language in the world, learning the language creates numerous opportunities for me in the working community and allows me to forge unique connections with people. Taking Spanish in high school has motivated me to study abroad in South America where I can immerse myself in the cultures I have learned about through the school curriculum. The cutting of foreign languages at the middle school denies other students the academic benefits that I have had. Students will not have the opportunity to learn about the many incredible cultures of Spanish countries, information that is particularly important in this day and age when many Spanish-speaking countries are not portrayed in the best light. Cutting languages at the middle schools makes it almost impossible for students to learn the information needed at the AP level and would likely end the town's language programs entirely in a matter of years. I hope you will make the right decision and choose to keep middle school foreign languages. And then uh, I have a statement of my own, but first I forgot to ask my daughter who is currently teaching English in Kazakhstan on a fellowship to write something, but I know she would have. She greatly enjoyed her, her French classes here at school and then went and learned uh, Russian in college. And here's my comments to you folks. I urge you to restore the tutor and teaching positions that have been eliminated in the draft fiscal year 19 budget and to preserve the middle school foreign language and extra English programs. <laughs> foreign language is extremely important and kids love it. And cutting a period of middle school English in grade six would have a huge negative impact on students who are transitioning to the more difficult writing expectations of middle school. I refuse to believe that we cannot find additional sources of revenue or alternative budget items to cut that would not be so devastating. For example, we could raise the family cap on user fees for sports and extracurricular activities, increase drama and band fees more, require a surcharge for more expensive sports like swimming, and I am a swim parent, and hockey to offset the rental costs. If further cuts are required, then perhaps we need to think about eliminating some sports or extracurriculars entirely. These programs benefit a few students, and many families would be willing to pay more to offset the cost of these, myself included. Meanwhile, eliminating foreign language and English classes in middle school adversely affects all students. And I have previously proposed uh, charging for parking at the high school, offering vol voluntary paid buses to offset the cost of mandatory busing, a service I would have gladly paid for when I had elementary age children. If the override passes, then perhaps we could reverse some of these cuts. But in the meantime, we need to find a way to continue to provide our students with a good education, even in tight budget times. I can't understand the thinking behind this budget. When did teachers become the first priority for cuts instead of the first priority in education spending? And in these tight budget times, <laughs> and in these tight budget times, why was money shifted from regu regular education to athletics and drama last June? That seems very short-sighted. In the future, I hope to see teacher positions prioritized in our district budgets. We should see, be supporting our teachers, not threatening to cut their jobs. Thank you. John, could you call the board, our board, to order so I'm not breaking any laws? Thank you. Um, Andy Friedman, uh, Hillcrest Road, uh, uh, parent, 
of three uh, kids that have all gone through the Reading Public School Systems and also a member of the select board. Uh, I signed up to speak this evening before I knew so many teachers were going to be here this evening. It makes me a little nervous, um, to be honest. And um, also following um, some of the, uh, the things that the, the, our students have, have said uh, is a little humbling. I was at your age uh, nowhere near as honest or as brave. Uh, to get up and speak like you've done tonight, it's, it's really, uh, it's quite humble. Um, to, the, to the teachers, I just want to say um, a brief note of thanks. Y you provided my uh, children with a phenomenal education and um, in, I, I'm not bragging when I say this because I didn't accomplish it my kids did and you did, but um, they, they got into Brown, Cornell, and, and uh, NYU, which I found out is the most expensive school in the country. <laughs> and, and, and that's really in, in no small part to your uh, tremendous dedication and, and instilling the love. I wanted to speak to the address the school committee directly um, as someone from the select board. Uh, you were all elected to <coughs> vote a school budget, and we were elected to vote a municipal budget and <coughs> vote and approve on a, a municipal budget. So, and I think it's become quite clear over the past month that there are some rather deep holes in those budgets right now that uh, an override will hopefully fill some of those holes. And it's with that hope that, that I hope that we'll see you at our, the select board meeting on the 30th when we discuss the override, put together an override, I'm hoping that we can do it as a team with the school committee so we can come up with an override that meets the needs of the schools and the town and is really uh, best for uh, as many people as possible in Reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Michelle Sanfi. Um, I am a town meeting member, 75 Glenmuir Circle. Um, before anything else, I'm a mom. Um, my husband and I moved here 16 years ago, and it was for the school system. Um, we have three children. I have a very vivacious and um, cunning 10-year-old daughter who has special needs. And I have, she has a twin brother who's 10, who is thoughtful and bright and kind and silly. And we're blessed with a 12-year-old who is um, highly inquisitive, very self-motivated, and um, I really think the sky's the limit for him. So speaking as a mom, the school system means a tremendous amount to me. Um, the Board of Select and the school committee, I don't know if you all know this, but they all volunteer. They do not get paid a cent. So I have a lot of um, respect for the service that they do. But I'm really here tonight to talk about Yes for Ready. I am one of the co-chairs. Erin Gaffin is the other co-chair of Yes for Ready. And we are a municipal ballot question committee that's purpose is to advocate to pass an override in Reading. In 2016, Yes for Reading formed and dissolved when the October 2016 override didn't pass. We all knew, and the executive board at that time was a little bit smaller, and um, they worked full time, and many of them are here tonight, and I just want to thank them for those efforts. 
Um, many of them rejoined our executive board because we knew then that the revenue problem was not going to go away. It was only going to get worse, which is exactly why we're here and is exactly why we reformed in the summer of 2017. We wanted to prepare and to get organized to get an override passed on April 3rd of 2018. And we are going to do it. We have so many more supporters this time around and so much more awareness. And these meetings are generating emails and telephone calls and I want a lawn sign and donations. And I can't tell you the flurry. And it is so incredibly exciting. But we need your help. We need to paint this town orange and yellow. And uh, not yellow, orange and blue. <laughs> Don't paint it yellow. <laughs> um, we need people to host coffees. We need people to talk to their neighbors. We need people to hold signs. We need to generate a bigger volunteer list. We need to get the high school students. We need to get the recent grads. We need to reach every demographic. We need to reach all of the seniors. And I want to tell you that George is a member of our committee. And he spoke earlier. Um, so I'm, I'm here to plug yes for Reading tonight. But I also want you to know the process. Because after all is done, and it becomes the school committee's budget, it then goes to the financial forum on January 24th. And at the financial forum, the school committee, the finance committee, and the board of selectmen, they'll deliberate. And the municipal and the school number will most likely be a part of their deliberation. I know that a lot of you are here tonight um, that aren't employed by the Reading Public School System, and thank you for coming. But all of you that are employed by the Reading Public School System or the town, this is your free time, and I, I apologize for having to ask this, but I think that January 24th and January 30th are extremely important dates to keep in mind because all of your voices need to be heard and all of your needs. Because we have five select members of the Board of Selectmen, John Arena, Barry Berman, Dan Eschminger, Andy Friedman, and John Halsey. And they have the sole responsibility and authority to put an override on the ballot on April 3rd and to determine the number. They need to hear everything that you have to say, every need that you feel is important, and I, I do think that they will listen. But we need to come forward with a number that is going to fill the deep holes that Andy Friedman was talking about. We have deep holes. We need to fill them. We knew the number was too high the last time, but we can't come in with a number that's too low. So thank you for your time tonight. Please get in touch with Yes for Ready. We welcome everybody's help. Anybody else? I think that's it. <laughs> well, thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, close the public hearing and take a uh, two minute recess.
committee meeting back to order uh, before we uh, do the reconstruction budget I did want to uh, vote on the consent agenda so we'll move to approve the consent agenda second is there a second a second all those in favor six zero Dr. Dar. Uh, I guess I can't mark the lamp, so I guess I'll just... No, yeah, it's one more. It's one more. So I think we're good. So thank you, uh, Mr. Ross. Before I present to you what I think is hope and future and vision, um, I just want to comment briefly on what we just heard. I have, well, first of all, I am very proud right now to be superintendent of the school district and to hear the stories that I get this evening, the students, the teachers, the parents. Um, we have a really great school district. You, you've been hearing for the three nights that we have been presenting the budgets, the quality of education that we provide in our school district. In spite of the resources that are available. I was telling the two, there were two students that came up, uh, actually still back there, um, and they came to my office hours this morning, and they did such, a, they did a great job uh, this morning, and they did even a great, greater job this evening. But, you know, they asked, they asked me a couple of questions about what I thought about this budget. And I said, I said, first of all, the very first thing I said on Monday when I was presenting this budget is that this is not a recommended budget, even though it's supposed to be, because it's not good for kids. It's a balanced budget. That's what it is. And I began teaching in the school district 31 years ago, 1987. I was a science teacher at Coolidge Middle School. And the things that were present at Coolidge Middle School in 1987, we're coming back to those levels now, if this budget passes, if the New York right does not. And to me, where I have put my heart and soul in this district for 31 years, that's devastating. So that was the thoughts that were going through my head when we had people up here talking. <coughs> But I want to shift gears now. I want to talk about hope. I want to talk about vision. I want to talk about a reconstruction plan for the Red and Public Schools. And we need to look at this as an opportunity to be able to take what we're currently doing and move from a reactive mode, which we have been for the last five years, um, because of the decline in resources, to a proactive mode. And to do that, we need to change the way we're doing things. I've been talking about that with the committee this year when we were doing our district improvement plan. We, none of us have been satisfied, obviously, with the direction that we've been going as a school district, and we have been doing things the last couple of years to be able to put things in place at different levels, at K-2, and um, in our elementary schools, and at our high school, and our middle schools, to, to work with teachers and give them the training necessary to to do the things that we feel we need to do, but time but it takes longer to do because we don't have the resources. And there's such tremendous change going on right now in our state. And I'll get into more of that later. So we need to look at this as an opportunity to not just put back things, because you will see that tonight, but also to do things that will change the way we operate in the Rand Public Schools, which will be in the best interest of our students and prepare us for the future, and prepare us for times like these when we need a more effective and more efficient structure um, with resources of time. So it's going to address our challenges, this plan that I'm proposing tonight, and I want to say out front that this is a plan that wasn't just designed by me. This has been a very collaborative effort with my district leadership team of the principals and our central office leadership team, we have spent a couple months talking about this and getting very excited about it as we moved on through this and what the possibilities could be and how we can change things. 
And I want to thank my district leadership team for the conversations that we've been having um, on this plan. This plan does a lot of things. It restores positions, it restructures existing positions that we talked about over the last couple of nights in the balance budget. Um, it allows us to Can you hear me now on CTV? Okay. All right. <laughs> it allows us to focus on the goals of our district improvement plan. Literacy, math, and math, closing the achievement gap, and social emotional learning. As I said before, we need to shift to a structure that's more proactive and less reactive. We know that our community over the last five years has not been able to support that level service budget for our school district. And that the budget cuts have been you know, resulting in less and less uh, resources for our, for our students. We also know that we've had reductions and will continue to have reductions in federal and state aid. The budget that we talked about the other night um, talks about some of those reductions that are happening now and that we're going to continue to see. Um, we are seeing increased costs, mandatory costs in transportation and special education um, and other accommodated costs on the town municipal side that <coughs> take away from the 2.5% revenue that uh, comes in every year. So as a result, over the last five years, we've had to reduce our level service budget each year, um, and it's been about $4 million. So moving forward, we're going to create this new vision that I was referring to, and I'm very excited that my entire team here tonight is going to present with me on this vision and what it's going to look like. Um, we also know that based on what happened in October, the amount for the override needs to be small. Um, and that community spoke loud and clear on that. And I think the survey results that the select um, and the, this summer also speak to that. So the challenge that we have is we need, <coughs> excuse me, to create a proposal that is less funding than an override but at the same time, effectively educates our children. So you're going to hear tonight reconstruction, you're going to hear restoration, um, and you're going to hear a lot of um, things that we have done behind the scenes to put us in a position where with these additional resources we can make some things happen. We also understand that this override couldn't be a just a simple list because just restoring a bunch of positions back is not going to change the way we do things. We need to find new ways of doing things. So just putting back a whole bunch of positions that we've lost over the last five years is just going to keep, we're going to keep doing the same thing we've been doing. We need to change the way we've been doing things. So there are three areas to the plan that I'm going to present to the school committee and to the community this evening. Um, the first area is the teacher student personnel piece, which I will be presenting. The learning and teaching instructional leadership and support area will be presented by Craig Martin and Carolyn Wilson. And the operations facilities athletics area will be presented by Gail Dow. So first of all, <coughs> this one is uh, the teacher student personnel. So the majority of the funding for this area is devoted to the classroom teachers and personnel who directly support students. And really this, this is the positions that we've lost over the last few years. It provides the financial resources also to do something that we really need to do, which is to retain the teachers that we have and attract excellent educators to the Reading Public Schools. It's going to restore several key positions. It's going to bring class sizes back to the elementary levels, to the desired levels, it's going to sustain the middle school structure by bringing back the grade 6 literacy block and the grade 7 and 8 foreign language. It's going to strengthen our academic interventions at the elementary school. It's going to increase advanced placement in other course offerings at Reading Memorial High School. And it's going to allow Reading Memorial High School to use the recommendations from the NIAS process, the accreditation process that they're currently going through, to restructure or redevelop programs and offerings to better address the needs of all students. Here is the reconstruction plan for the area of teachers and student personnel. Restoring six high school teachers, restoring the seven middle school teachers, 
that are being recommended, are not being recommended, are in the balance budget. Uh, the six high school teachers have been positions that have been cut over the last couple of years. Restoring the four elementary teachers, <coughs> excuse me, that are in the, um, the balance budget being presented. And restoring an elementary tutor for um, at the elementary level that is also being reduced in this balance budget. We also have the, a line item, the salary adjustments for retaining and attracting staff. This is a similar line item that we had in last year's override budget. We believe this is an important piece of all of this area in order to continue to strengthen um, our, our ability to attract and retain staff. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Craig Martin and Carol Wilson at the same time. Um, and they are going to talk about the next area, which is the learning and teaching instructional leadership and support. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. As Dr. Doherty was saying, in talking with our entire administrative team, we knew that the majority of funding had to go back to restore these teaching positions. As you just saw, our educators in the classrooms that are working directly with kids are the backbone of our school system. Uh, but we also realized we had another challenge that how do we make sure that we support those teachers effectively <coughs> given the constraints that we have. Um, we knew that funding would be somewhat limited. We knew that sustainability was a goal. And we know, quite frankly, um, that times have changed. And you know, when we meet with our colleagues in other districts, um, they have positions and structures that we will never be able to have. Sometimes multiple coordinators for curriculum, coaches in every building, um, directors of technology, so on and so on. Um, and it's not worth trying to put things in place that we know we wouldn't be able to sustain. And as I think Dr. Doherty was saying at the beginning, we have to take those two values that we have in our community. I'm a, I've been living and working in the Reading Public Schools, living in Reading for over, around 25 years. Um, and we've reached a time where those two values seem opposing, but they're not. You know, how can we do something in a different way um, by restructuring, but being very cognizant about the challenges that we face for our current era? Just in the five, last five years alone, we've seen the state um, roll out three new curriculum frameworks, and they're talking about a couple more yet to come. We've had three different state assessments, much more rigorous SAT, MCAS, AP exams, very different types of assessments now, requiring kids to apply knowledge in different ways, critical thinking at different levels, um, a much more increased importance of technology in our world and certainly in education, an increased emphasis on social emotional learning, which makes a lot of sense. I think sometimes people wrongly think this is something new, as an educator now for over 30 years, we know that social emotional learning has always been a part of education. Um, that's, it's what we are as human beings. Sometimes those are the obstacles that prevent us from achieving. Um, what's new is not that. What's new is some of the challenges that society has now brought to our youth. Some of the wonderful speakers um, and our students spoke about them today. Um, so that makes sense in the, in the challenges that youth are facing. Uh, more kids that are, are dealing with the challenges of depression, anxiety, making it difficult for them to come to school, um, the opioid crisis, substance abuse, um, addiction uh, challenges. So all of that has been happening in the last several years at a time in Reading where budgets are having to be reduced, which has created a new challenge for us. As I said, we knew we were always going to be fairly lean when compared to many of our surrounding communities or peer communities and so we knew that we needed to look at very sparingly the key things that we needed perhaps to add but we also needed to look at restructuring our leadership infrastructure in ways to support teachers um, it just really seems unfair with so much change going on to not be thinking about doing that for teachers um, we also realized that's why I'm so proud to be working with Carolyn Wilson um, it was referenced some last night, and we hope to echo that again tonight. 
that regular ed and special education cannot be two silos. They are working together. Their success depends on each other. And we've been doing a lot together that I think is beginning to make a difference um, in our community. Okay. So with these challenges and things that we're seeing, we are making changes and we are doing things as a district to move forward despite some of the limitations. We have talked about multiple times about how we are implementing a multi-tiered system of support. Our teachers are looking at data at their building levels. They're looking at ways to provide interventions. Each of our schools have intervention blocks in place for struggling students, not just for students with disabilities. We're making shifts in our practices despite some of the challenges that we have from a budgetary and a leadership um, perspective. We're using the Walker Report that was done a few years ago to really look at our special education practices and make changes in moving forward to improve special education. We are starting to have consistency in our practices across our elementary schools and in general education and in special education. We've made huge growth by having stability in our team chair positions that are allowing for our children and our families to have consistent experiences no matter what school they are in, which I'm very proud of that, that work. We are seeing more collaboration with our staff. I had the opportunity to sit yesterday with our um, Bridge Program PLC, which is our professional learning community of teachers. And even they were reflecting that just two years ago, we didn't have this time that was dedicated for us to come together vertically from elementary, middle, and high school and talk about our programs and look at data and look at what we're doing in our practices. These are great practices for our teachers and they are are appreciating that time to collaborate. We are, we are looking at how we're training our teachers very focused on our goals and how we can use those resources, focusing on K-2 practices to move the needle for our students. We are more effectively identifying students eligible for special education and really targeting with appropriate services. I review a student IEPs weekly. I, I kind of do a random sampling. And I'm just so impressed with the way that our teachers are able to target goals. You don't see cookie cutter goals. I see different goals that are truly based on the needs of the students that I'm reading the evaluations and saying, wow, my teachers really know how to target um, the intervention and the supports that those students need, which is really exciting because as I talk about last night those plans are individual and they're not something that should be oh I just drop down in a menu and I pick out a goal um, our, our staff are really doing a great job at understanding instructional practices and how to instruct different type of learners there's still work to be done but our teachers are dedicated to doing this work and we are doing our best as a leadership team to make that time available for them to put resources towards having training training come to them. We're also in the process, starting next week, we will be doing a review of our language-based program at the Parker Middle School, um, having um, an outside consultant come in through using some of our grant funding to really review that program. We put a lot of resources into training of the staff, providing coaching to the Landmark School, and we really want to see if what we're doing is having an impact. So we're excited about the feedback we were going to get through this special education program review. And that's why I was talking with the teachers yesterday, and they were excited about this opportunity to get some feedback to say you know what we're doing good things and we know it and we want to be able to highlight those pieces Flip to my next page so so this part of the plan, which is an exciting part of the plan, is about supporting our teachers and creating an administrative and a leadership structure that allows us to support teaching and learning, which is such an important piece in our district. Um, it is The focus is on integrating both general ed and special ed. We want our administrators, all of our administrators, to be able to be instructional leaders, supporting teachers and their instructional practices um, so that we can meet the needs of all students as we talked about yesterday and we keep reiterating this really is about providing a cost-effective proactive way of meeting our district um, goals and moving us forward and improving student outcomes 
So as we keep saying, our goal is not to put in place all these positions that we can't sustain. We need a model that is cost effective, that will provide us the type of supports we need to respond to those curriculum changes, those other changes that come to us in an effective way that supports our teacher and implement our teachers in implementing those changes quickly so that the change happens for our students. We can't wait years when there's new changes for curriculum to come to our students. We need to be responsive to that. Um, it's really important, as one of our teachers talked about, our students need timely feedback and meaningful relationships. Well, so do our teachers. They need feedback from their instructional leaders, from their principals and administrators. It needs to be timely and they need to have meaningful relationships so they can improve their practice. So we are looking to make a more effective use of special ed and regular day funding. These positions will, that we're proposing would allow our principals to become more effective in their roles as instructional lead leaders and make Reading a more desirable place for um, our teachers. Our teachers need to feel supported. Um, the components of this plan are that we would have two K-8 to um, district-wide curriculum coordinators. We would be restructuring the RISE Preschool Director and adding funding to have an Assistant Director of Student Services. This was part of conversations we've had um, last year, this year. It was part of the recommendations from the Walker Report is putting together a structure in the Student Services Office that truly provides that support. Um, an exciting piece, as you'll see in that third bullet, is a restructuring at the elementary level to have team chair slash assistant principal positions that would allow for support at each building. Um, we have included in this teacher training for curriculum instruction and instructional shifts and technology replenishment um, included in this. So as Carolyn was saying, uh, well, first, we thought we'd kind of take each of these, maybe one at a time, to give a little more detail, even though this is kind of a, a 30,000 foot overview. As we t talk with our leadership teams, one of the challenges that we know our district faces is that we are so lean that we are always reactive, not so much proactive. We are caught up in the managing of the day-to-day -day activities and don't feel that we're able to provide the support that our teachers need on any day, but especially in a time of so much change happening all at once. Um, so we thought we'd first take a look at the role of curriculum coordinators. You might remember that a few years ago we um, tried putting some instructional coaches in place. We don't have those now. What we've realized is what we truly need are full curriculum coordinators, two of them. Um, as I mentioned, many districts have many more, sometimes one for every content area or one for each level. We've realized to have two district-wide K-8 curriculum coordinators, one for the humanities, specifically English language arts and social studies, and one more STEM-focused, which would be science and mathematics. These positions would provide invaluable support to teachers during this time of such tremendous change in standards. And as I said, the state is anticipating more to come. These people would be making sure that we have a vertical articulation that makes sense. Um, in our curriculum, they'd be involved in all curricular and instructional issues that affect directly our student achievement. They would be people that have deep expertise in their content area with instructional experience. They would work closely with teachers, building principals, and central office staff. We've realized that the structures we need to put in place have to create capacity and empower every administrative position, from our positions to the building principals to anybody who's supporting teachers to be true instructional leaders and coach people together, that we're working collaboratively in that. We've talked about how we're restructuring our positions to do that, and these positions would help guide us in doing that. Um, they would collaborate very closely uh, with area colleagues in other districts. Um, because many other districts, most other districts, as I've mentioned, around us have these types of positions. Um, certainly since I've been in this role, I've realized the benefits in collaborating and even the cost savings that comes when we're able to collaborate um, regionally. Mostly they would be making sure that we've aligned our curriculum and instruction both vertically, K-8, K-1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and horizontally. 
across a particular grade level, across classroom to classroom in a building and from building to building. Uh, they could be coordinating training for staff, both delivering and participating in training. These essentially would be in-house professional development providers. Um, and when we needed to work with other trainers, they would be participating so that they would be able to follow up. Um, they would be helping all of the administrators get the knowledge they need so they would, we would be doing that, building principals and central office administrators to be able to do that with teachers. Coaching teachers and administrators in these strategies that we know help students reach these new expectations. Visiting schools and classrooms daily to provide support and feedback to teachers, but also to administrators to give us all the knowledge um, and time that we need to be able to do that. And then this tier one part, I want to hand it back over to Carolyn because it's, many people might think this is more of a general ed issue. As we talked and, and we realized that this affects both areas um, in the conversations we've been having in, in the last few months. So I want Carolyn to talk a little bit about that. And as I spoke last night about how the success of our students with disabilities is truly dependent on the strength of our tier one program. And over the years, we've, we've noted that our regular ed budget, our regular day budget has been cut and cut and cut. And so these positions are so critical as the director of student services who oversees our most vulnerable populations what I know is that if we don't have a strong tier one curriculum we will not see those students continue to succeed every student in Reading deserves to have access to a strong tier one curriculum and we want that for our students with disabilities as well as every other student who comes through the door and so having curriculum coordinators who can focus on that work and help our teachers so that our curriculum is not dependent on work that's done with teacher leaders. We need people who are dedicated to this work, who are experts in curriculum and instruction so they can guide and help improve teachers in their craft. Everyone, every one of our teachers wants to improve their craft. They want that feedback and they are seeking ways to improve what they are doing with students. And if we don't have the infrastructure to do that, they're not getting that timely feedback to improve the outcome for students. So as we were looking at this design, I was just as passionate about these curriculum coordinators and the impact it will have on our students with disabilities and our ELL students and our other vulnerable populations as I am about the other changes, but I think this is such a key um, position to moving our district forward. And then I'm gonna shift to some of the, the restructuring that we're looking to do around special education. So we are looking at, I, we don't quite have a name for these, so it's kind of like a team chair, assistant principal, some sort of administrator at each elementary school. As I spoke about last night, at the elementary level, the only school in our elementary school in our district that has a, one team chair dedicated to it is Joshua Eaton. All of our other elementary schools share a team chair. And so that person is driving around town, spending time in their car, um, in between buildings, and trying to connect with staff when they can. And we really feel so strongly that we need a leadership model like we have at the middle school, where we have a leadership team at each of our elementary schools that's focused on general education and special education and supporting our teachers. This position would continue to do the responsibilities of a team chair, overseeing the IEP process, participating in regular meetings, providing leadership to the special ed team, but they would also be involved in supporting the tier one work, the tier two work, providing supervision and evaluation of teachers, which is not something that we have right now. Our building principals are the sole person at each elementary school who does supervision and evaluation of our teachers. And so this would allow there to be a team at each of our elementary schools to provide leadership and support to our teachers and be responsive to families. Having two administrators at an elementary school would really allow us to have more contact with families and, and really support students. The, the second kind of reconstructed would be to take the RISE preschool director. Right now that position is RISE preschool director slash team chair. So um, our RISE preschool director does the functioning of um, like a principal at the RISE preschool with supervision and evaluation. They, they monitor enrollment. They do open houses. They do kind of the principal management. And in addition, they do the team chair function where they run IEP meetings. 
they process paperwork, they go out and meet with families in relation to early intervention. And so our proposal is that we would put a team chair um, at the RISE preschool to manage those IEP components and have the RISE um, preschool director be combined with an assistant director position. So this person would still manage the RISE preschool from that um, supervision piece but we would, they would then take on some roles of leadership in our district. And some of the things that I see that I unfortunately don't have as much time for and want to really support is providing more leadership around our special ed professional learning community. So as I said, they do meet vertically and there's such great work happening and having an administrator who can oversee that and do that work is so important. They would also be looking at our district programs and providing support to those programs, being out observing, collaborating on supervision and evaluation. I also see them working to monitor our out of district placements and looking at all those students and seeing where they're placed. They wouldn't be the out of district coordinator. Um, our model right now, because we eliminated an out of district coordinator position, is that all team chairs have a caseload of out of district students as well as myself. Um, and we would continue that model, but having someone who is kind of overseeing that and ensuring that everyone's caseload is equitable and really organizing and managing that is really important. And I think the other piece is that there's one of me and we have eight building principals and they need support at the building level and I can't always be there um, when there needs to be that support. And so having, again, that support for our building principals around issues that come up with special education is so critical. Um, and being able to collaborate at the district level because sometimes things that happen at the building level need a little bit of additional support from myself. Um, and so having an assistant director who can help um, our principals navigate some of those trickier situations or support um, the building staff is really important because again, there's one of me and there's a lot of needs in our district and I, and I do my best to be out there, but um, you know, we need more support around that um, because our teachers want to improve and they want to see those outcomes. So these are exciting changes that we think are sustainable, that would help support our teaching staff, and that we really feel would result in, in changes in outcomes for our students. Yeah. And then this next piece in this line is about um, instructional materials and supports. So, even with all these shifts in our, um, in our structure and our leadership, we still do need materials. Uh, we can't um, continue to not budget for um, the need for ongoing curriculum up updates. We need up-to-date curriculum materials that are evidence-based. Our teachers need access to those materials. We can't be behind. Um, and having those materials, they need to be aligned with the current frameworks and the current standards. We need to have a cycle for updating these so students have that tier one curriculum material. We also need to be, as we put in place these um, intervention blocks, we need opportunities to get materials for our teachers for those intervention blocks. We need to be able to provide them materials. We need to be able to provide them training. Um, our teachers are willing to be supporting students in this tier two model, and we haven't really trained them on what are some of the, the, the interventions you can provide that are evidence-based that will result in student improvement, and that maybe just that six to eight weeks with that student in a smaller setting would result in them really grasping the concept. So we, we feel that there's a need for the ongoing materials, but also those training opportunities for our staff so that they understand how to use the materials, they're up to date on current um, practices. In addition to the curriculum materials and training and support for teachers, other items like technology that we have to make sure that we're recognizing the role that that's playing today in our world and, the, and its role in education. Um, I've been an educator long enough that I've seen technology change several times throughout my career. We had several teachers, I think, referenced tonight that spoke. Um, what happens, just the lag time, um, when new te technology is unable to be implemented in a timely fashion? I remember some of my very first days as a teacher when something as simple as the overhead bulb would burn out. Right? And we knew how to get through the day. But I always assumed that bulb would be replaced by the next day. It wouldn't be weeks. 
so forth. And so we need to make sure that we are replenishing our technology, that they have a lifespan. We need to make sure that we have enough technicians to make sure that if something's going wrong, that it's not just an inconvenience, it actually can have an impact on the instruction that a teacher is able to deliver to students. And so we need to be able to fund that properly. Um, again, these, the call for material, the, the restore some of the funding for materials, restore some of the funding for technology and the technology support, anticipates that this is going to be an ongoing part of our world and that the state is going to be updating other continuity standards. And as I think I said earlier, we have to support teachers in this way both in the personal support and in the materials and things in order to make these instructional shifts. It's a very different time. And that's to say nothing about just the world that we're preparing kids for now. We know that the future that we're preparing our kids for, we, some of it we can't imagine. It's certainly very different than the future that we were preparing for when we were in school. Um, and to do, to expect our teachers to make these shifts without this type of support is just not realistic. For any teacher of any level, I can certainly, I mean, as a secondary teacher, I want to give special kudos to our elementary staff. I don't know how they do it when you're teaching all these different content areas at one time. When you've had a shift in English language arts, math, and science, and there's more to come, um, and you're expected to make that shift all at once in your practices, using new resources, using new curricular programs, that's a tremendous amount that impacts our ability to support them, it impacts our abilities to, re to retain wonderful educators. And so I think we need to do this for our teachers um, and the outcomes will, will show up in our students. So, this is an overview of this section with uh, what we were projecting the cost to be. Um, some of these are some new implementation, but many of them are taking some existing positions and adding a little bit more to restructure in a new way. And I think, you know, just to echo in conclusion that what we are trying to put forward is a model that we think is lean, but that is going to allow us to be responsive to change and that we can sustain over time. And that will have a real, um, we, we see this having a tremendous impact on our students by having the right leadership structure in place. We see us being able to be, as Dr. Doherty said, being more proactive in our approach and not reactive um, in our day-to-day -day practices because that's such an important thing in a school. We want to be proactive. We want to have the right structures in place that support teaching and learning every day. Thank you. I actually only have two slides, so I will, I will do it from here. Thank you very much. The last section on the reconstruction plans is a relatively smaller section and focuses on three areas, operations, facilities, and athletics. The first area that we wanted to talk about was the need to improve artistic operations as it relates to all personnel matters. As you saw when we went through the budget presentations, we currently have a .5 FTE that is for payroll and a .5 that is for HR generalist work. We also, that is not within our budget, we are very fortunate that we do share a position with the town. We have a point four FTE on the HR generalist side who helps us out two days a week which has worked out wonderfully for us. But as we realize as we continue to grow and change the district we do have additional needs in terms of part of it is to create some segregation of duties as we do only have one person responsible for payroll so if that individual is out we actually do not have anybody else that can perform those functions. Myself in my role I actually cannot process payroll, enter new hires, or do any of that work from an overall segregation, <coughs> segregation of duties area. We also do not have any backup or redundancy for our HR administrator. If she is out of the office, we do realize there are instances in which processes related to all HR issues do tend to come to a little bit of a halt. <coughs> Dr. Darty and I do step in and become HR administrators, but oftentimes as far as reference checks, making offers, those items do come to a bit of a, a halt and we do realize there are times when we can lose candidates because of that. 
also as we just presented our other plans we do realize there'll be if an override is proposed and passed that there would be new employees coming into the district we also know that the onboarding process the new higher induction mentoring for all the new teachers we do not have the capacity or the ability to really check in with the new teachers during their first couple of years of employment to see how things are doing and is there anything else we can be doing for them onboarding while it sounds relatively simple you think the benefits it's also the new employee setup when a teacher shows up day one or administrator it would be great to be able to ensure they have a computer they have a password everything that they need all of everything to get them set up is there also as we talked about we've been attempting to deepen our substitute pool so this would give us the capacity to do more substitute substitute training ensuring we have the depth and knowledge in that pool as well so that is why we're proposing to add this position to really help round out the HR and payroll functions and it would also allow us the ability to greatly thank the town for the use of our HR generalist but allow us to be able to give that position back to the town uh, but we'd be happy to keep it either way <laughs> Uh, the other thing that as we mentioned during the budget process we are once again reducing the cleaning contract which impacts the high school we do realize based upon the cuts from last year and based upon the cuts that we are proposing to make this year it is not sustainable and we also know the importance of making sure we are maintaining our buildings throughout the process so we would like to be able to restore those additional deep cleanings that happen during the vacation time that we would not be able to do with our current custodial staff the last item that we do want to look to restore are the athletic games so the two games per sport or per category we do realize the importance of that for the students who participate in the sport so that is an item that we would be looking to add back as well so these are the three items so the, the vacation cleaning and the athletics those are basically the same amounts that you saw coming out of the balance budget and then the payroll HR generalist that is the position that we just spoke about that would really be able to help across the district across all levels to really help the, the teaching and administrative staff So one of the things we also want um, to emphasize is, as I said earlier in our <clears throat> in my uh, introduction, is that we've not restored everything that's been cut since FY 2014. And here's a here's a list of some of the things the two coaches. Uh, we had a middle school health teacher that was cut a few years ago. Uh, we have restructured our physical education classes at the middle school to get more <coughs> health education in the middle school. Um, and we feel that that's a good model. Again, looking at the ways to be more effective and efficient. We have um, a high school secretary position, a high school teacher position. Um, Paraeducator hours have been cut and reduced over the last several fiscal years. Uh, 45 middle school reading specialists, which I think you heard about this evening. Uh, virtual high school, uh, there has been, although we have proposed increasing um, professional development training, in this uh, reconstruction budget, there has been a significant cut in professional development over the last several years. And a 1.0 FTE tutor that um, is in the balance budget uh, reductions for this year. So this, this evening was a more of a 30,000 foot view and to give you an understanding of the plan um, and some of the specific areas of how we feel this vision moving forward will improve our school district, make us proactive and less reactive. As we move forward and um, the board of like selectmen uh, make have their deliberations and, and ultimately make a decision and if an override ballot question is put on with, with an amount of funding, um, at that point is when we would educate the community even more as to the specifics of the areas that we would be moving forward with. Um, but we felt this is this is the first step. This is the introduction. Um, there will be plenty more opportunity for discussion um, as as the weeks go on about uh, this plan and how we how we plan to move forward um, in, towards this vision. 
So this is an overall summary of everything that you heard this evening. Uh, one of the things that we also, um, and I know that the town manager did something similar in his presentation the other evening, is the, the, the cost, <coughs> excuse me, the cost to what would be to the school department budget would be a little bit under uh, $2.5 million. However, with personnel, there will be a benefits cost. And the town manager, um, had, had, had in his presentation, had calculated an amount for, for each of those positions. Uh, we're using the same calculation as he on, on the benefits piece. And so what you see is that would be the benefit cost, which would be an accommodated cost, which would be in the town um, municipal portion of the, of the budget. So which would be uh, $454,250. So that is the, the overall summary of all of the uh, proposed uh, positions in the new reconstruction plan for, for this evening. So I believe that's it and we'll, we'll take any questions or comments. Or I'd like to open it up to questions from the committee. Is there anyone? We good? Okay. We can stay on that last slide. Go back to the, the dollars on that last slide. Okay. Can you help us understand how you came up with these estimated amounts? I know this is a forecasting exercise, so it's not precise, but it strikes me that you know a lot of the additions are additional full-time equivalents or FTEs, so additional time for investing in people doing work for our district and for our kids. <coughs> it's about 21 FTE is what I count in that chart, setting aside the two, that say two lines that say restructure. So if there's 21 FTEs, I'd like to understand better, there's a cost associated with those FTEs up there. And is that cost the year one cost, the year two cost, the year five cost? Because the cost of an FTE is naturally going to go up. And so what I want to understand is the sustainability of those figures. So if we're looking at a you know, projected cost for amounts or benefits, whatever it is, how did you model that? Is this a cost that is intentionally greater than just the year one cost? And are these numbers going to have legs? So in other words, in, in three years, if, if the taxpayers decide to buy this, uh, then if our, our these numbers going to still be true in, you know, at what point in three years, two years? So can you walk us through the process of how we came up with those amounts and how sustainable you think they are? These are the year one costs. We are, we are basing it on some assumptions. Uh, the, the teacher salaries, we're using a certain figure and um, same with the relocation tutor. These are you know, these are common numbers that we would use for positions that we would be bringing in. Uh, yeah. So, you're talking specifically about the FTEs, I'm assuming. Is that this is the so these are, these are year one costs. So, how they get absorbed is at just like our current budget is uh, there's a lot of variables that go into the amount of revenue that's available each year. Uh, that's determined in the fall each year by um, by the, at the financial form, and that's based on um, expenses, it's based on revenue, um, accommodated costs, projections. So the amount, the increase each year for the budget uh, would be the determining factor in terms of the sustainability. But these are the actual year one costs. We did not build in extra costs because we really can't. Because this, this would be the funding that would go to the school department. You can't build an extra cost because there wouldn't be a mechanism to access that in future years. So you just, one follow-up question and then I'll be done. So to be clear, this is just the cost of bringing these additional resources into the schools, but no accounting here whatsoever for what additional money would be required to retain all of these resources within the schools after year one. The budget we're developing, this would be for FY19, so that's the number that we're looking at. This isn't FY19, this is an override. This would be for FY19 if the override passes. But this isn't just FY19. If the override passes, you're going to have to pay these people in 20 and 21 and 22. Correct. 
And that's going to. And that would come from that. that would come from the increase that we would receive in our budget, like we do every year. So we're running a 5.2 percent level service increase year over year right now. This and, and we believe that this will help this. reduce that 5.2 percent because we are restructuring what we're doing which is going to have an impact on one of our biggest areas that we're an increase, which is special education. Okay, so we're increasing the number of FTE, and we're hoping that we're going to be able to pay for it later. The plan that we have put forward this evening um, is going to make us more effective and more efficient and more proactive, and it will be able to help us adjust to budgets in the future. I guess this question is for Carol. Uh, on the rise, uh, direct, rise director slash, I guess, assistant director of uh, student services, is that, I, I, maybe I missed it in the, maybe I missed it in the uh, presentation. So are we, we I'm assuming we're taking something away from the RISE director. Is that the team chair response? Okay, yes. that's what yes. I was wondering. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, I just want to comment on the uh, Mr. Bobbins um, line of questioning because this was all, very almost exactly the same line of questioning to the town manager on um, Tuesday night. And um, he, there, there was um, an acknowledgement also by um, Select Arena that previously, the last time we did this override, there was sort of a significant amount of money and complicatedness that was put in to try to add money to it to account for the ongoing years. Because this community, uh, when we passed the 2003 override after two failures, it had been uh, more than 10 years since the, oh, 93 was the prior one. So now, are we at like 14 years or 15? Okay, so, uh, yeah, 2003, so four, 14. So, um, you know, we were, we were trying to account for the fact that we hadn't taken smaller steps in the past. And so, from the discussion on Tuesday night, the response of the town manager was that we would we will have to see where the revenue is where you know aid is coming in and new growth and then we will end up with a percentage um and what this budget uh, if the administration can do what they expect to be able to do with these restructuring would hopefully reduce the pressure on whatever that fincom budget guidance is for the increase for that year it still will allow us to be level service that's the key there's going to be a percentage there and will that percentage that's required to do level service keep up with that I think we all know, and we recognized on Tuesday night, it was discussed again, it's not gonna, that's not gonna continue year over year. And whether this is something that this community needs to revisit every three years or four years uh, is, is something that we're gonna have to look at. But it's surely not gonna be every 10 years and every 14 years. This is, um, I think there were some statements, there were some amazing statements made tonight um, and um, my family goes back, my husband's family goes back four generations in writing public schools. His, my husband's grandfather's diploma, high school diploma is signed by W.S. Parker. Um, so I, I hope someday to turn over our house, which was built in 1929, by my husband's grandfather to potentially one of my sons one day. And so if people think I don't care anymore because my kids are out, and they got to go to great colleges because of this school system, they're wrong that I don't care. Because I have actually been stressed and thinking about what someone said, we're slowly dismantling, it's a steady decline, we're subpar, we're going backwards, we're antiquated. The thought that I would not feel that it would, that Reading schools would be good enough for me to someday sell my house to one of my sons so they could raise their family here and have a fifth generation of kids graduate Reading High. That is, that's why this is so important. That's, that's why we need to, re, we need to restore those teachers. There's uh, 18, 
17 teachers there? What do we have? 18, 18 FTE in the top section. And the um, I think the remaining 6.4 that are part of this will really help us to um, help make the teachers more effective so that the outcomes to the students can be there um, and really make a direct impact and help have us have a sustainable structure. So. Yeah, I, I think uh, what Mr. Bobbin was getting at, I think Dr. Dari said the same thing. Whatever we vote on uh, next week, uh, we have to be comfortable with the sustainability mm -hmm. because we can't, uh, you know, I'm still uh, seething over some of the things that aren't getting restored that we've we've added in recent years. I don't want to do that with it. I'm concerned about that we're not, you know, we're, we're having to put the science curriculum in this budget as opposed to having it sustainable in the other budget. So I think that's, I think you both agree that, mm -hmm. you know, there has to be sustainability on whatever we vote on. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a I have a question about one of the items that wasn't restored, and it's the virtual high school program. Oh, is that not on? How about now? I can just talk really loud. Yeah, just, I think uh, get a little closer. Uh, my question is about uh, virtual high school. I'm wondering about. <laughs> that one's definitely working. Okay. Third time's a charm. Um, my question is about virtual high school. It's not on the list of restorations, so we clearly didn't make the cut. I know it's a small dollar amount. I think it's, a, no, it's south of $20,000. Can you talk a little bit about the thinking behind that? And this comes from a concern about it. Um, I certainly know a lot of students have accessed it for a variety of different reasons, and it's been really helpful. Can you talk a little bit about what is in place instead of it that will meet those needs? We feel that the addition of the six high school teachers is going to um, increase the number of opportunities that students are going to have accessing courses that probably right now they would only be able to access through virtual high school. So we would see an increase in advanced placement courses and other electives that currently do not exist. Thank you. Yes. yes. Hi. Um, I'm looking at the salary adjustments and I'm wondering, uh, I, I know that salary adjustments is a very complex issue because it has to do with all kinds of uh, things, but um, I'm wondering if you could talk some about where you see the need for salary adjustments and why and how you arrived at this figure for them. I can't say a lot about salary adjustments because right, it would I, be involved with the collective yeah. bargaining. Mm -hmm. um, so th the thinking behind this is when, and you know, I use, I use teachers as the example, um, when you take a look at our teacher salary scale with comparable communities, um, entry level teachers are a little bit above the median, mm -hmm. um, but as a teacher stays in the Reading Public Schools, they fall below. Uh, comparable communities. So the dynamic that begins to form is that we bring in a teacher early on in their career and we do a great job of getting them trained, supported, they get some experience and then they leave because they can go to another school district and make more. Okay, so you're looking at that line, it, the heading on, on the column there, well, the, the heading is teachers, student personnel. So you are envisioning that as um, faculty or student or teaching mostly adjustments. Uh, this would be for yeah. This would be for all educated. Staff. All no, it'd be, it'd be, oh. it, it would be for all staff. For all staff. Teachers are your largest group. So. And d can you uh, maybe you can say anything about how you came to uh, that number? No, I can't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> yes. Linda. Did that one get working now? 
I'm hearing a lot about the teacher training and professional development, and I do agree that it's really important. I'm wondering if within the professional development budget, whether there's included a component of the teacher feedback as to what they think is most important, effective for them, and um, that I, I also wanted to say I really like the idea of the curriculum coordinators and their role in the training within schools so that it's not drive-by training, it's uh, bringing in what's cutting edge but also what the teachers feel they need and then following up and being supportive for that and having people that actually understand the curriculum there as backup within the school. But I'm just wondering about that component of the teacher feedback and making sure that the training is the most effective for them. Thank you. I think Craig, this is yours. I was looking out to see if a teacher wanted to take this, take this question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think you kind of answered somewhat, somewhat in your in your question that I think to have, you know, you use the term we, we don't want drive-by training, which I think you mean, you know, training that, and that's often the case. Um, I don't think we're the only school district that faces that challenge. That sometimes we can have wonderful, outstanding training, but it's the follow-up that needs to happen. Um, how do we embed it into the daily work of our staff? Um, how do we make sure? You know, I, we talked about instructional leadership. How do we make sure that our building principals, that the assistant superintendent, the director of student services, our coordinators, all have the same information? So that's a part of the ongoing conversations, the ongoing feedback, the, the classroom visits that are happening, um, that we are using our time with our staff to follow up, to where the staff are getting to support each other in that. Um, I think that is really meaningful. Um, training and professional development that has almost immediate impact on kids. Um, we don't want to be in a position where sometimes I think we find ourselves, to be honest, where teachers think that was, a, and I've been there myself years ago as a teacher, where you think that was an outstanding training. And then you go back into the trenches and days go by, weeks go by, and you're the best intentions of being able to, imp of wanting to implement something that you think you're so passionate about, it just is very difficult to do. Um, but if we embed that into our daily, weekly work, and then it starts happening in that way, so, yeah. I mean, Katie, I welcome. Did, did you want to yeah. say? I mean, I don't want to embarrass you. I can't speak at all, but I can say that in, can, can that's okay, I'm comfortable with that. I can talk. Um, on RCTV, yeah. I could talk a dog off a meat wagon, but not in this forum. <laughs> so just in relation to professional development, um, I've had conversations with John, with Sarah Levesque, with Craig, one-on-one, um, -on -one, just to say the PD that I had this year recently in the area of writing and math has been the most valuable PD I've had in 20 years. Um, I've been in writing for 20 years. I started here at Rise Preschool as a para. I worked my th way through. I was at kinder, yep, I know a lot of faces. Yeah. <laughs> um, kindergarten teacher, special ed teacher, <coughs> interim team chair, um, full day, half day, second grade, learning center, I've done a lot. Um, I'm proud to be here. Um, we need every single bit of what you've heard about. We need every single cent of what you see tenfold. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I mean, everything's been said, and I just urge everybody to really understand it. And I keep hearing it's what the teachers need um, to support our teachers. And as much as I appreciate that, it's what our students need. So take me out of the equation. Take our teachers out of the equation. This is for our kids. Mm -hmm. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Give me 500 kids, and I will stay here all day. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are a few things that are not on that chart that we talked about last night, and there's three that I'd like to bring up here. And I'm wondering why they're not on the chart. I called them a double whammy last night. The first part is the additional, the reduction in circuit breaker funds, about $200,000.
So I'm asking myself, do we expect 200,000 back or do we not? So one idea would be to add 200,000 to that to cover the loss of circuit breaker reimbursement and accommodate cost. If, if this is the right table to put that in, it may not be, but if there's another table, that's fine, but I just don't see it here. The second thing is the additional transportation for out of district special ed students. That was 245,000. Let's call it 250. Makes the math easier because the third thing is the additional 50K in consumables that we talked about last night. So our consumables budget went from 50K to over 100K. If I add those three numbers up, I get $500,000. It seems to me fairly likely that we're going to face that cost year over year over year over year. That's a great thing to put in an override request. So I'm wondering if we could account for that 500000 somewhere. I guess, just to clarify, so the increased transportation and tuition is included in our recommend baseline budget, so those costs are included within the numbers we presented. Yes, but we're making a number of reductions, too. The reductions that involve restructuring the middle school, they involve other things that we, we talked about on other nights. So the question is whether we want to in include an accommodated cost number on this chart as part of the override for accommodated tuition and transportation, which again is a very fluid, relatively unpredictable number depending on the student population. We have a certain number of out of district placements. We have a chart with a track record of how many out of district placements we've had. We have a certain percent of special ed students, which has been hovered around the state average for 13 years. And we have an uptick in consumables that I think relates, based on what I heard from last night, to an upgraded curriculum with that's more hands-on and has more consumables. We also have a reduction in state aid for circuit breaker for reimbursement for special ed. And last night I heard that the somewhat widely held view is that we shouldn't expect an increase in state aid in the foreseeable future. Together, to me, that logically suggests some amount, and we can debate what, what that amount is, but its absence from this chart is very striking to me. Okay. We had not factored in some of the accommodated because it is such a variable number. State aid, typically, I wouldn't have included state funding or grants within no. sort of an override we, it's number, but we can go back and discuss the out-of-district tuitions and transportation and look at the best way. I mean, what if, whatever it is, it's not zero. We're going to need some money for those three things. So I'm, I'm confused. I thought um, you just said that though it's in the FY, you know, we did, it is funded in the FY19 budget. So I just want to make sure I understand that. And also, is, it the, is the consumables isn't the consumables in the budget? The you consumables are in the budget. Um, okay, so the consumables, the 50,000 of consumables was in the budget? Is that, I just want to... They're in the budget, yes. The 100,000? No, the, the consumables are part of the per pupil number that we showed you last night. They're in the budget. They're not cut out of the budget. The alternate way to flip this thought is to take the 800, and was it 850K in cuts that we had in 19? 853, I think it was. Yeah, it's 800 around 850, is to take what we're cutting out in place of those revenue gaps that I just described and include and limit this to those things that we're having to cut because of reductions in those three areas or additional costs in those three areas. The, the reductions we're making now are here. They're already in here. Can you explain that? Removing the teacher. The, te the, te the reductions that were in the balanced budget, with a couple of exceptions, are in here. In the restored teachers. Yeah, I think you're thinking of the spending something on the revenue side, but we're going to have about that 500K difference over what we've had in the past. We, we can address that as a, hey, we're asking the, the ask here, part of the ask here is to restore the revenue sources that we have lost as a result of the circumstances I just described, or the additional expenses that we have to take on. So for instance, transportation could be a line item.
Um, oh, you have a discussion on the point. Or, or I, 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 I'm confused. I don't because now I'm just a little confused. Could we just look at, let's say, circuit breaker? What do you, which, what are you thinking? Because I understand the budget that's proposed is making the assumption we're going to get less money from the state it's than actually, circuit breaker money. Can, can you, so what is, what do you want to see in this budget? Because we've already taken that into account. Are you challenging that you think the state? will actually give us more than expected? I'm just a little so, confused. No, no, the opposite is true. I think, I think we'll get, well, I'm not the expert on this. For I mean, we heard that it, it could be less, that we had $200,000 less in circuit sure. breaker funding than expected. We can promise that money to particular FTEs here, or we can simply state, and it's, it's, it's just a different way of approaching it in my mind, that we're, due to a reduction in state aid, we're asking for the shortfall in state aid as a line item. So in a I think what Nick is saying, saying is with this, we're restoring the positions. Yeah. But we're not restoring the lost revenues from the, uh, the budget we looked at the other night. We're not restoring the $200,000 in uh, loss. So is it? Is that, is that what you're? So the, the yeah. loss, so we can't adjust circuit breaks. So that is that's a state number. I can't put a higher number in for circuit breaker. So that's a state number. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you want us to increase. So we did discuss that right now. There is a potential shortfall within the accommodated cost because we think a the amount could go up for circuit breaker depending where the state ultimately comes out. We have potential for extraordinary relief. Is the Second. Thought to put back the potential hundred to hundred and thirty-three thousand as yeah. part of the override <laughs> budget, or I guess I'm just because this. I, I, I'm pointing the okay. let, me, let me just complete the point, and we move on. Sure. I want other people to be able to talk, and I want to be able to go through other items. I don't want this to be at this one point. My th th thought process is simply this: last night we just identified just about a half a million in, in combination of expenses, transportation, revenue shortfall, circuit breaker. They happen to be in a special area, but just globally for our budget. We're, we're making cuts to our budget in FY19 in excess of the that shortfall. And this proposal has a series of FTEs with year one costs in it. If, if, if the ask is structured around FTEs where those FTEs are always going to cost more over time, and that, that rate for the FTEs that we have is going up at 45 to 5%, not 25 3%. Anything that we, we promise in line item here, I feel that this is, this is our roadmap, this is our proposal, this is what we are going to do. And so we would bring in these additional resources. Some of these resources would cost more over time. And we, would con we don't know how much more over time. We don't, I don't want to be in a position where we're successful and then have to come back and be making more cuts because we've, we've brought in additional resources that cost more money than, than the, the pie is growing over time. So as an alternative, what I'm thinking is, could we address it on the shortfall side and say, we're 500K short, could we ask the voters for 500K to cover the loss in revenue and have the flexibility to be able to invest that in one or two FTE for specific areas. That's the general concept. Not globally for everything, but it's, it's an idea that I didn't see represented here and that I wanted to just add to the discussion. So I'm sorry if I got out of hand. I'm not sure I entirely understand this, so correct me if I'm misunderstanding it, but a potential problem with that approach, I think, and I'm actually going to look to Dale and Dr. Doherty um, to <coughs> both of you to correct me if I'm wrong, but that would seem to me to be double counting. If yeah. the FY19 balanced budget yes. includes those revenue shortfalls and the cuts to Square them, right? Mm -hmm. We've yes. accounted for them. This is in addition to that budget. So that to put a five hundred thousand dollar figure in this and say we need five hundred thousand dollars more, but we all know we already accounted for it, isn't that double counting? Only if the budget's already been passed. It, it, it is double counting. When we developed, when we developed the balanced budget, those assumptions, those are budget drivers. The decrease in state aid yeah. is a budget driver. Yeah. The decrease in uh, the increase in transportation tuition is a budget driver. Those are already in the balanced budget. Right. 
So the, the positions that were cut are up here. So that, that's what, I just want to say one thing about circuit breaker that I, I think is important. So, and Carol, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's around, except for this year, because it's an anomaly, it's around a million dollars. That's because it's been funded at 75%. So if now the new norm is 65%, we're not going to see another hit next year because it's going to be 800,000. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to get another hit of 200,000. This is going to be unless they decrease the percentage again, or the threshold. But the new norm right now is, if, if that's the case, we're not gonna take another hit of $200,000 mm -hmm. next year. The only other part I would, and I'm not, if I speak out of tune, the, the only other concern I would have is if, that if we wanted to go back and change what we have budgeted for our accommodated costs, it is not necessarily as easy as that because you have the pie accommodated costs come off the top, the rest then gets distributed. Right. If I decrease my accommodated cost, more is available to the operating budget, which then gets split. So right. if I take out accommodated cost and underfund accommodated cost to put it in the override budget, that money does not then become ours in the operating budget. It no. becomes as once right. they take it. Yes. And then I do, we are required to pay those, so I'm, I'm not sure if we would be comfortable saying we're going to now take it out of accommodated costs, put it as part of an override. If the override doesn't fail, we go back to the town to ask for the money. That would be a caution I would have, understanding how the math works with how the figures are generated. But please correct me if I'm no, no, wrong. You're right. You're right. You're right. Mark? Yes. Sorry. Uh, Mark Doxer, Beaver Road. A um, couple of things strike me in, in the discussion, and just maybe it can help to, to bring a little closure. Um, right now, those shortfalls are already accounted for in the fiscal 19 budget. If I understand this correctly, this would be on top of. So, to your point, assuming that the fiscal 19 budget had passed and an override passes, then this would take place. Second is that the way we're dealing with those overages in, or excuse me, underages in uh, Circuit Breaker um, in particular. Let's start with that one. Um, we deal with that as an accommodated cost. So in other words, it is, it's already covered. It's kind of pre, this is, which is where the unaccommodated budget. I'm gonna make it even, even, even better if I can. The way that we take items like accommodated costs Let's take health care. We set a budget, we have an expectation of what it'll come in at. It may or it may not. If it doesn't, we use free cash as the buffer. So I think we could make the argument that, that might be exactly what would happen here. If suddenly there's an unexpected change further in circuit breaker, then that's a way that we could, we could talk about using free cash to cover that. We do it specifically with health care. There's one other, what's the other category we do it with? State aid, thank you, state aid. State aid. Great example of circuit breaker. So state aid, we have an expectation, excuse me, we have a desire as to what state aid will come in at. And it's not come in at that typically. We make an adjustment for it using well, free cash. The whole basically. purpose of, of a, right. establishing the accommodated costs was so that we didn't have those fights on town meeting for or exactly. need for more money. So exactly. that's not as easy as, <laughs> Yeah, and timing would be the other part of that also. So the timing off times is after we've already voted a budget. So we create a buffer, and it sounded like one of the things you were looking for was, you know, could we have another buffer because things may change again. And that's really what we use accommodated costs for and use free cash to balance with. And just one thing to, while FY20 circuit breaker could potentially, it could go up, it could go down, if they change the funding rate, which we don't know. FY19 is locked in. That number that is in the budget, the 860. That's a definite number. I can't number. guarantee the state won't, yeah. but that is a guaranteed number because that is a number they have published that they are already distributing. So what is in the accommodated cost for FY19 is actually a definitive known number that could potentially only increase, not decrease, for FY19. <laughs> Yes. 
uh, John Arena, Chair, Board of the Selectmen. Um, Nick, I, I, not to belabor it, I think the point is the lack of support is already funded in the base budget. That gave rise to the, what was it, 847 or 843 and unfunded. That gave rise to some reductions in heads. <coughs> this restores those heads and adds more. So I think it's all, I think it's already accommodated okay. to overuse that word. On uh, Monday night, on page two or three of the presentation, there was a discussion that 100K of funding and a separate line for 133K of funding were, were assumed, the title of the slide was assumptions, to be funded from free cash on town meeting floor. As a method to fund fiscal 19, that's a better assumption because it's a one-time uh, budget, it's a one-time discussion. But as in context of an override, if we don't address those 233, if I understand correctly, those aren't necessarily recurring funds out of free cash. So do I misunderstand? There was an assumption slide shown on Monday night that described it was 100K of, of free It was 150, that was the science curriculum. There were two line items that I thought right. that One was the science curriculum, which is in here. That's already there. Yeah, that's right, it's curriculum updates and renewal. Okay, so that, that obviates the need for the discussion on free cash. And the second item on Monday night was? It was the 133 above the accommodated cost for tu tuition and transportation. Is that in here as well? That is not included in here. That's where we had the discussion that if there is the potential that the funding rate could increase from 65% next year. So the, the circuit breaker is 65% at the beginning of the year. Historically, the state has increased that funding rate later in the year. We're also applying for extraordinary relief which we do not know yet if we qualify. The other part that is difficult, difficult about the tuition in out of district is that's based upon the population Projection. that we did, I would say, probably 45 days ago, that that population continuously changes. So there is a chance that that number could go up or it could go down. That's the number that we're monitoring to determine if the other two potential sources of revenue might be available to us as well as the change in the population. But if the, if the proposal on the screen passes in some form, mm -hmm. you will not need to ask FinCom in town meeting for either the 150 or the 133, true? The 150 would not is, need is baked to be in here already. that's up there. It's the, in there. the 133 is an item that we continue to monitor that we have not included on here because that is a number that if we did ask for it and it came and it became an accommodated cost and then transportation and tuition and all of those other items changed. It's an item we may not need. So we hadn't factored in the accommodated okay. cost. If it breaks the wrong way, how do you fund it? We had been having the discussions that if it were an accommodated cost, that is where the understanding was that you, you could go back to town meeting. But we then it's a recurring ask. That's my point. No, I don't, I, it, it fluctuates. It fluctuates. Yeah, it fluctuates. But, but Just like it's fluctuating now. I understand I it fluctuates, but if you fund it in year one and you presume it's funded out of free cash, you can't build subsequent year budgets based on that. No, because, because the students, the number of students fluctuate. I think the way we're looking at this is very similar to the way the town not to use the same comparison because it's not the way the town looks at snow and ice. So if there is a year that you need more to remove snow and ice to go to town meeting, that's what that's what we're referring to here. That would say that then the 130 is already funded at some level in the, I'm sorry, that budget line item is already funded at some level and the 130 is an overage. Yes. Is that yes. the way to think of it? That's yes. exactly All right. what Thank is. you. Yeah. Sorry for is if, if I could um, follow up on that, because thank you, Mr. Arena, for sharing that thought. Another concern I would have, if I'm following you correctly, is if we were to say, just as a placeholder, we want to protect this 133 because we might need it, and then we apply for extraordinary relief, or the state aid number increases, and so it turns out we really didn't need the 133 at all. We needed none of it or just a tiny little portion of it. That's a couple teachers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's resources we're not putting to our kids who desperately need it because of something like snow and ice that maybe might happen, we couldn't possibly, because of all of those variables, we couldn't possibly protect it. So it's another hesitation I'd have with that plan. Okay. Um, so I'm also um, a little concerned about if we were to try to build in something in an override budget. If that budget doesn't pass, but it's something we have a legal mandate to fill, I don't think we should be kind of uh, 
depending on an override passing to fill a legal obligation. Are you talking about this amount? No, I mean if we were to build in the proposal here, that, as I was understanding, Mr. Boylan's proposal. I think the but it, it's actually yeah. already right. still yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, about the 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 tuition, uh, I'm sorry, the curriculum updates. Um, so it, I'm guessing this is for science for the That's upcoming year, but it looks like we're trying to build in um, a, a continual amount to anticipate tuition. I, I'm sorry, I keep saying that tonight, <laughs> but it's, it's on my brain. <laughs> Curriculum <laughs> updates. Um, so what, what are some of the uh, drivers behind that? Like, are there new, new frameworks coming down? Is there other... Uh, curriculum that's been that's badly outdated. Why are we why are we wanting to build that into? What's the rationale for building that in? Thanks. So, yeah. Yes. So the first year would be to complete the um, science update for the grade levels that we have not yet done. Um, we're anticipating that there's some more materials that we're going to be needing for reading to align with the new state. They're not even that new anymore, but state standards. The state has been talking about um, releasing in the very near future new social studies mm -hmm. um, standards. Um, and then we're just simply in the budget. We don't want to go like we did for science in the past where, you know, I think Dr. Doherty said he started teaching in 1987, which I think ironically was the text, the year of the textbooks that we just got rid of yep. <laughs> for science. Or they were. I, I, my daughter had um, those. And also that the type of curriculum, especially digital resources and mm -hmm. things that we're using, they will require renewals mm -hmm. every several years. Um, so we're making sure that those are staggered. So that just simply allows us to update much more quickly when there are new standards being released and also making sure that we're renewing with the latest digital resources and things. So in, you know, I, I know a little bit about digital resources, but not as much as you guys do. So are they, are those are they almost working like software licenses in a way where you get a certain number of years access to those yep. texts and then you, very, if you don't renew them, yep. you very, don't have them? Very similar. I mean, some of it is um, digital text, but many of them, I think we, we showed some of them or talked some about some of them um, in some of our science presentations. They could be um, digital simulations, mm -hmm. things that, for instance, that kids couldn't readily do in a science lab. Dissection um, kinds Things of about stuff. space and earth science and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, and the publishers regularly update and as technology improves, um, improves those types of things. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's similar to a software. It's not software. Um, it's access to those resources. Um, but yeah, they tend to be anywhere from three years to eight years. Um, the They're term limited, in other words. Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah. Barry, did you have a question? Um, Barry Berman, Board of Selectmen. Um, I actually had a very similar question uh, when we did our budget the other night to Bob that Nick just brought up about the whole sustainability. Um, issue is that you know th th this uh, this whole process has kind of taken a ton of energy and oxygen out of the whole town and no one wants to keep coming back and doing it you know every year or two um, and while the mistake we made last time was that we said let's just do this once and get it done in eight years you know not have to come back in eight years you know and that made the number really big you know we, we, we heard the re you know we heard the resounding no that came from the town but still there needs to be some type of sustainability so when we question Bob about sort of okay you've laid out your 30 kind of priority issues um, you know which we'll kind of go you know go over you know what kind of fat what do we need to add into these you know to kind of on a yearly basis to kind of give us an idea of what we need to ask for to have it last even you know three years let's just say and what Bob had said is that the numbers that he gave and, and most of those were salaries because most of all of our budgets <coughs> including yours is you know we invest in people not you know pencils and computers um, is that um, the salaries that he outlined were sort of the top of a top the top salaries and he didn't necessarily think that he was going to have to hire everybody at that top, you know, at that top line. So essentially, if you hire someone at sort of at a, lo a lower step, you know, there's your sustainability there as, as they grow. Plus the other thing, and, and, you know, I brought it up the other night and keep, we'll all keep talking about it, is that, you know, 
we have 16 projects in this town that are permitted that are going to break ground at some point in 2018 or 2019. And that is going to give us uncharted, we don't know the amount, um, but our new growth has already gone from the, some of the multifamily housing here. Um, you know, we've asked the assessor to kind of give us a, a number. Um, and it's not unrealistic to think that our new growth, which is about seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a uh, hundred thousand dollars a year over the last three years, conceivably um, could be a million, million one, and a million two. So can you bank on that? No. But, you know, are all 16 projects going to happen as planned? No. The economy can change, developer capacity, those kinds of things. But will 10 of them get done? You know, probably. And will it be a little bit longer? Maybe. But, so there's that whole new growth figure that um, I think is, is going to basically allow this thing to kind of, once we make the commitment, say, okay, this is what we want to do, this is how we're going to get done, you know, get a lot of this stuff done, a lot of the stuff that we had, you know, that Bob had put down on his priority list, um, and we sort of have, okay, that's the baseline. I think with the new growth that we can sustain it, you know, for a long period of time, um, and it'll last until it doesn't. And then we have to start this process again, um, hopefully not in a year or two or three or five, but whenever it is, and we go back and we say, we promised you in 2018 we were going to do this, this, and this. Did we do it? Well, time will tell. Um, and the voters will make the decision to re-up. Hopefully it's not in a short period of time. So th that is the sustainability piece. Plus, you know, we grow 2.5% a year. But so again, so, so don't these salaries. So, um, but that is how I think when Bob laid it out and what we're thinking is, um, you know, how this, uh, we're not going to promise eight years, right? I think that was a mistake we did last time. But I think this is a way to get this kind of, you know, once we make the commitment, I, I think we'll be able to kind of uh, have this, you know, the growth in the economy um, take care of itself. So that's kind of how I think Bob addressed it. It's probably the same way to think about it here. I, I don't know. I don't know if these are the the right numbers. I'm sure not all these numbers you're going to hire at, at that top level. I, again, I don't know. I don't know how you guys do it, but um, that's the assumption that was built in um, by the town manager, and I'm assuming that's what could be done here as well. So. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mary. Um, I think that new growth, growth is something to look forward to, but I want to underscore that we can't wait till then to fund our education. It, it's great, it will be great when it happens, and I have faith in this town, but it's essential that we know that we can't wait three years to fill the needs now because what we don't fill, what we cut now is going to take a lot more money and a lot more um, effort and time to get back. And some of what we will lose, we won't be able to get back. The wonderful teachers that we're going to lose, we can't get back next year if we cut them this year. They're not going to wait. They're going to be scooped up by other school systems. So it's already good to think about the new growth, but that doesn't help us today with this budget. Um, so I understand that was part of the discussion. The other thing I wanted to um, say is that I really like the restructuring in this, um, this budget, the bringing in the people on the ground into the assistant principal's positions, combining that with the team, the team chairs. Um, and bringing in a special ed assistant director because I think people are only human and Mrs. Wilson is only human and our teachers are only human. There's only so much they can do and we always need more done and just anybody can't fill in for these positions. We can't have just anybody looking at videos on a bus because it's confidential stuff. We can't have just anybody going through the paperwork because that's confidential stuff. We have to protect our children. We need trained people to do it. So I appreciate this effort. Um, what I am not seeing in this that I expected to see was the restructuring for the finance um, department assistant. Well, that's in FY19. Uh, that's in the baseline. Okay, so I will leave. Thank you. 
Yeah. <coughs> is it a new, new topic? No, just a <laughs> 30 seconds left. So um, I just want to make a clarification if I wasn't really clear. Um, I just, you know, Linda and other folks who I, I might, might have misinterpreted. Um, my um, exuberance for new growth um, is not um, as a replacement for the override. It's how the override gets sustained over time. So it, it's not, it wasn't like new growth is going to replace. I, I just want to make sure I that, that, okay. I get that. I right, want I, to make I, sure I, everybody got that. All right. Well, I'm just... Did everybody get that? <laughs> Thank Got you. It. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I want to thank Mark, Gail, and others for helping me with the numbers the last time. Um, I'd like to just clarify a couple things on this chart, changing gears a little bit. The curriculum updates and renewal, is that the 100, if it's 150K, is that the same 150K that we had talked about in the past to complete the science curriculum implementation. Okay, so that is that last yes. third and final that tranche is. of science mm -hmm. curriculum alignment with the standard for evaluation in the state, right? Yes. Okay. Um, in a moment, I'm going to want a little more understanding of the restructuring that Carolyn and Craig talked about. What is that? Um, taking existing, it looks like, 3.4 FTE and just giving people more responsibilities and therefore more compensation, or is it something fundamentally different? The word restructure suggests to me it's not hiring entirely new, new FTEs. But before I get there, I want to highlight one thing in the top <coughs> section that I noticed to me, and I'm sure this hasn't escaped anybody here, we have a lot of comments about that, that second line there, that seven FTE middle school teachers, what it doesn't say, I want to make sure I understand this, that is the restructuring of the middle school day. Like if, if, if that 500 plus 125 or 625K estimated cost I see in row two, if that is restored to our schools, it's not just seven middle school teachers, although it is that, it's a, re it's a um, you're adding an extra class period to the middle school day. Preserving. Pres well, what, what this is going to do is co that's continue, continue what we have, we have now. now. It's continue what we have right. right. So thank you. You, you, re you retain. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That, that was on an earlier slide. Also. Right. So yes. yeah. But I want to. It was on. A, but I want to highlight it in this chart because I think it, it really sets that row apart, and, and it ties in on the vast majority of the comments we heard tonight. You were you were retaining a class period that would otherwise be lost. And you yes. were, that allows for additional support for students, not just to access foreign language, but to provide twice as much time in English language arts and to reduce the number of students in an English, English language arts class by half. Right, so it does a lot for Absolutely. our kids. Yes. Right? I just want to highlight that. So do we want to go to the, the restructuring piece, sure. give you a little time sure. to warm yeah. up? But help us understand yes. exactly So currently we on. have three FTEs for across the five elementary mm -hmm. schools for team chairs. So the proposal is to have a full-time assistant principal slash team chair in each elementary. In addition to that, okay, so that means we need to add two. So that's would give us five. In addition to that, what we're doing, as we talked about, is we're, we're taking apart the RISE preschool position. We're saying there's RISE preschool, and then that person is also the team chair for RISE preschool. We're pulling out the team chair responsibility, so we need to build in. That's where that additional point four, point four is to build in team chair for RISE, so the RISE preschool director can assume the responsibilities of the assistant director. That's, so that's how that works. Um, can, okay. Oh. So on on that, uh, how how much of the year of that assistant principal slash team chair? How much of the day do you anticipate being team chair? Should be half and half. Um, I think it would be about half. I mean, right now, our um, every elementary except for Josh Wheaton has half-time team chair. So they, they literally do spend about half their day, which is IEP related, in each building. So I don't see that increasing in terms of those IEP responsibilities. So the other half of their day would be able to do those other administrative, the other half of their week. You know, it may be, most of our buildings do schedule certain times that they have IEP meetings, that their team chair is available. So they would continue that structure. 
and then they would have the other time but they wouldn't be at the other building that would allow them to be supporting things but it's going to be fluid because it's you know our students have needs you know that's not like oh now I'm doing IEP paperwork and there's a student or teacher that needs me I mean their administrators are going to respond to that as well okay yeah I just want to say um, one of the things I really like about that is when I think about outcomes for kids um, now, if you have a teen chair who has to know basically two entire student populations, I think that kids are going to be so much better served by this model because one person gets to know that building, the dynamics of that building, the teachers in that building. And so I can see how that could really um, help with prevention and intervention in special education, reduce the cost later. I don't like to look at kids as um, a dollar sign, but still I see how it can be a very cost effective relationship building with the children, um, prevention, intervention. So I really do, I can really see the benefit of that for the kids directly. Sometimes, you know, as an educator, I'm very sensitive to the idea of more administration. Um, that doesn't always feel directly related to students, but I see how this is. So I want to just say I appreciate that. Oh, not this one. <laughs> Doctor, I don't know. Who, maybe this is John. Uh, so I just want to just to go back to that assistant principal team chair.